It is 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Jared Blickery. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking some early session volume for you folks while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. Happy Monday, happy Monday, everybody. And Brad, stock futures searching for direction this morning to start the second quarter of the year. The key debate on Wall Street this quarter is whether the S&P 500 has any more room to run after its best start to a year since 2019. That's right. And updates on the labor market will put the market rally to the test here. We'll get fresh readings on job openings, job cuts, and non-farm payrolls throughout the week. So let's get right to it with the three things that you need to know, your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Pross Supermanian, and Madison Mills have more. Hey, Brad, stock futures searching for direction to kick off the first trading day of the second quarter. The major averages coming off a strong start to the year, positioning or posting their best first quarter in five years. Investors are still digesting that latest inflation print from Friday, showing moderating consumer prices, which could keep a mid-year interest rate cut on the table. But the highlight for this week, the jobs report will put the market rally to the test, and we'll be waiting for that one on Friday. Plus, Tesla announces new price hikes, though not unexpected. The EV giant lifting prices of its popular Model Y vehicle in China, Europe, and the U.S. ahead of its first quarter delivery report. Despite hot competition in regions like China, Tesla's price hikes come as analysts are revising their Q1 delivery forecasts lower. And Disney's proxy battle heating up. The fate of Disney's board will be determined this week following activist investor Nelson Peltz's months-long battle for a boardroom shakeup. Peltz currently seeking board seats for himself and former Disney CFO Jay Rizzullo. The results of the shareholder vote are expected to be announced at Disney's annual shareholder and stockholder meeting on Wednesday, although it's possible a last-minute deal between the two sides could emerge even before then. New month, new quarter, new week, new trading session as well it. here. We got news all across the board, but we'll see if we can get some more highs over the second quarter this year and where that momentum will continue there. You're taking a look at the futures here. We're searching for a little bit of direction, flat just barely to the downside for the Dow Jones Industrial Average right now. Those futures just barely one hundredth of a percent yeah. in negative territory, but the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq in positive territory as of right now with about 25 minutes until the start of the trading session. Yeah. After that blistering quarter, I think everybody will be happy for that one basis point increase in the Dow futures. But let's take a look at what's happening here. We got some pre-market quotes. XLRE is up 76 basis points. That's three quarters of 1%. Real estate was in favor a couple days last week by memory. Interesting leadership there. But now we have materials and energy also outperforming. Tech up about one third of a percent. And nothing really trading to the downside. We see some red, but that was the background color from Friday, where we did see tech and communications services and consumer discretionary in the red. And I just want to point out what is going on in the gold market. Uh, let me take off these pre-market close. Gold is at another record high, up 1.66%. Mm. And let's just take a look at the year to date. Now, after climbing above 2100, it's really accelerated here, uh, 2150, 2160. And now to the upside, I'm seeing targets of 2500, 3000. And I would also point out that crypto, the other gold, also, well, Bitcoin is down 1%, but Bitcoin is holding around 70,000. It's just been consolidating over the last month, and we'll see if after this consolidation in April, if we can move to the upside here. Yeah, well, searching for a trend here to really kick off the second quarter and looking for catalysts. Today's top story, the first trading day of the second quarter, and we're watching futures tick higher for the Dow, or well, at least for the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. We'll see if the Dow can find its footing. This is coming off of the back of the best start to the year for stocks since 2019. The S&P 500 notching several record closes in just those first three months. The index also ending the first quarter up over 10 percent. The tech heavy Nasdaq up over 9 percent and the Dow up by about five and a half percent. So what are those catalysts that investors should be watching as the second quarter kicks off? Joining us now on this, we've got our very own Josh Schaefer. Hey, Josh. Hey, Brad. So if we're asking for a trend here to start the second quarter of 2024, I would highlight the labor market. 
Of course, it's the first week of April, so we're waiting for that March jobs report to come in. But overall, I think the labor market story has been one to watch. What you're looking at here is the estimates on your screen for March jobs data. You're looking at 216,000 non-farm payrolls expected to be added. The unemployment rate to sit at 3.8% and year-over-year wage growth at 4.1%. If we zoom out and just think about what those numbers mean, it means the labor market has been overall resilient. And one of the top things economists have been highlighting over the past couple months, really over the last year now, is just the concern of the Fed staying higher for longer and if these labor numbers hold up. Do we start to see any level of weakness? I saw an interesting stat out there today that some companies are starting to mention layoffs a little bit more in earnings calls. Does that actually trickle over to jobless claims data, to weekly claims data? We haven't really seen it yet in terms of labor market data, but at some point we're gonna start to see slowing, at least people think. How much slowing do we see? Is it too much slowing? It feels like there is a, there's a sense that we're playing with a little bit of fire here. Yeah, right? I mean, expectations are for another 200,000 increase in yeah. payrolls. This has been the theme. Uh, this is not even a weakening of the labor market mm -hmm. right here. This has been a continuation of strength. And I'm just wondering, any signs of weakness on the horizon that you're expecting or that you've seen maybe in some analyst notes for this Friday? Anything that points to uh, some slack in the labor market? Yeah, it seems like overall what people are highlighting with the labor market now, one thing that we'll have a story coming out on soon here is the unemployment rate that we've seen pick up on a state-by-state -state basis. Now, you could debate whether or not that is a true sign of what we're going to see nationally, but what you are seeing is unemployment pick up in certain states, and it's a little bit nuanced, Jared, but in some aspects it's showing us that, of course, the concerns of going from 3.7 to 3.9 on that unemployment rate are real. Right, The fear, of course, with the unemployment rate is always if it keeps going up a little bit more and a little bit more, we know that it tends to spiral. So I would say that will be one of the big ones to watch because economists expect that to come down to 3.8%, largely because we've had an increase in supply of workers. Yeah. And if we keep that trend going and we don't see unemployment tick up, I would say that's, a, that's an overall positive. There were a lot of columns, a lot of writing that was out over the weekend about the Magnificent Seven, whether yeah. that is fully the Fantastic Four. I mean, what are we hearing from some of the analysts out there? How much has that conversa conversation shifted now to just four names instead of seven? Yeah, Brad, it seems like it really has come down a lot from seven names to four names. You could really argue, is it really just one or two names? Mm -hmm. When we look at those names on our screen here, it'll be interesting to see. I think when we think Q2 overall, is which of these four names are we still talking about as leading the market at the end of June? Because I don't know if it will be all four of them, right? I think if it was all four of them, you would maybe say that's a surprise again to see these companies continue to beat at that pace. But I think outside of the MAG7, MAG4 conversation, it's are we still talking about a positive broadening, right? Yes. If we well, end we Q2, but are we going to be at the end of the yeah. quarter, right? Will gotcha. that continue throughout the quarter? That seems to be a key, a lot of strategists think, to this rally continuing. All right. Well, you will be here, I know for yes. sure, on Friday. So we'll look forward to that yeah. as well. Thank you for that, Josh Schaefer. Now, inflation is ticking higher last month, though still in line with expectation. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge, that's PCE, it increased 2.8% compared to last year. We got that data point Friday. This is exactly the sort of data that Fed President Jerome Powell wants to see ahead of potentially cutting rates later this year. Now, Powell is tamping down expectations of rushing into a rate cut. He did that last week. And let's listen to what he had to say. The economy is strong. That means that we don't need to be in a hurry to cut. It means we can wait and, and become more confident that, in fact, inflation is coming down to 2% on a sustainable basis. For how investors should be looking at inflation data, we have Gary Schlossberg. He's the Wells Fargo Investment Institute global market strategist. So, Gary, uh, just your big picture view here. What should we be expecting? Well, we are seeing inflation coming down, but that so-called disinflation has slowed noticeably the progress against inflation at a rate still above the Fed's target level uh, has slowed. And in fact, over the past couple of months, both the CPI and the Fed's preferred PCE deflator measure of inflation actually have ticked up a bit. So the jury is still out on just what sort of trajectory we will be seeing on inflation and how the Fed will respond to that, I think. Part of that is the employment situation and the readings that we're going to get on jobs over the course of this week as well, Gary. What most notably would you be watching for in terms of a trend that the Fed is really looking to play out here as they're continuing to implement strategy and policy right now? 
Well, the numbers have become a little more mixed lately, as you pointed out. Uh, things like the quit rate, uh, layoffs, uh, have begun to uh, decline and increase, respectively. My take on the job market, though, is that it's still holding up quite well. We could see the unemployment rate tick down to 3.8 percent. We're still looking for another healthy gain in the job market. So we still have some good momentum, and as Chairman Powell has pointed out, uh, with these kind of numbers and backstopping the economy, which is holding up well, uh, the Fed shouldn't be in any real rush to cut interest rates and certainly not cut them aggressively. Uh, Gary, I want to talk about the market, and we are just coming off of five solid months of gains. And as you note in your notes to us, uh, pretty unusual to see a winning streak like this. But uh, as I'm fond of saying, strength tends to beget strength, and that's especially true in the stock market. What are some of the particulars of what we might expect historically when we have these five months of strength like we do? Well, we certainly see the economy riding a good bit of momentum. Yes. Uh, growth is holding up. Uh, the market is optimistic on Fed rate cuts. That opens up opportunities for further upticks in valuation. In this kind of environment, though, we uh, uh, focus, we favor caution out there. Uh, defensive stocks, quality stocks, liquid stop stocks, which mean large cap, focusing on the U.S., developed markets uh, to some extent. But we uh, maintain a, an element of caution out there going into the uh, second quarter of the year and into the latter part of the year. We think there are some soft spots in the economy which will reduce its momentum and temper that earnings growth that we've seen holding up so well. Where will spot, soft spots that you're also tracking internationally also have a broader influence on some of the economic um, readings that we're starting to get here in the U.S. as well? Well, we're expecting to see uh, inflation continuing to come down, but the growth in world trade has been quite uh, gradual at the moment. There are encouraging signs in the last couple of days out of China, but all in all, the world trade environment has been difficult. Uh, Europe is constrained more than the U.S. by fiscal stimulus. So we do look for the European economies in particular and the developed economies in more general to lag the U.S. Uh, in this uh, uh, economic growth over the next several months. And as I said, we see some headwinds developing, not very strong ones, but developing uh, in the financial area, credit quality, uh, delinquency rates moving up, saving rates historically low that can slow the economy's momentum here and to some extent overseas. Gary Slosberg, Wells Fargo Investment Institute, global market strategist. Gary, thanks so much for taking the time here with us today to Thank kick you. off uh, the right. second quarter. Definitely. Thank you. Well, the electric vehicle pricing, the EV battle heating up here. Tesla raising the price of its Model Y cars, and that's ahead of its, uh, well, in both the U.S. and China, and its Chinese competition is looking to capitalize as well, we should mention, offering incentives and price cuts to lure customers. Yahoo Finance's Prost Romanian joins us now with the details. I almost said ahead of them putting out their own delivery and production numbers here, which we're, of course, expecting sometime this week. Yeah, tomorrow, actually, yeah. So I uh, just want to note that these price cuts are not, unexpected. They were going to happen after the Q1 as they wanted to kind of ramp up some of those incentives to get people to buy these cars ahead of the end of Q1. So we're not kind of surprised by these price hikes. They're, they're only about 2% or so, both in the U.S., China, and also Europe, too. You know, for in the U.S. in particular, they're talking about how buy this car now before it goes up by $1,000 on April 1st. So here we see that there for these, these Model Y trims uh, in particular. But, you know, I think there was expectation that would, would Tesla kind of maintain the current levels? Would they actually raise the prices by $1,000? They, they did, but then we'll see them probably cut that back in a few weeks as they want to gin up those sales in Q1. Or, sorry, Q2. Yeah, Praz, I keep reading reports about Elon Musk and perhaps that he's losing a little bit of his cachet in the U.S. Um, consumers in general are not as attuned uh, into the Tesla Tesla brand as they might have once been. Um, and there are various surveys, and I keep reading articles and opinion articles about it. Is, does Tesla, does Elon Musk still have the, the same draw that he did years ago? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I just saw a report today from Reuters uh, citing some caliber data. It's a, it's a research firm that showed that the Musk effect is real. It's sort of bringing down enthusiasm for the brand from potential buyers, noting that it's already a pretty tough environment to buy EVs right now. And if you add the component of Musk sort of being controversial and maybe offending some people that would otherwise buy a Tesla, they're not doing so now. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. There is a 
at, at the very least on the margin problem there for Tesla, for, for those buyers that could say, you know what, maybe I'll buy a Ford Mach-E because the, I don't want to be associated with Elon, when they, they would have bought a Model Y. I will say, uh, anytime somebody's counted Elon out in the past, they have been wrong, so we'll have to see. Yes, 100%, 100%. All right, Praz, thank you for that. And coming up, an AT&T data breach over the weekend leaves millions resetting their passwords. We're going to break down some of the top trending tickers up next. Let's take a look at some top trending tickers that we're watching for you here this morning. Take a look at ticker symbol, or ticker symbol T. AT&T facing a data breach over the weekend telling users it had to reset passcodes for 7.6 million current customers after their data was released on the dark web. The breach also impacted over 65 million former account holders. The leaked data included things like social security numbers, mailing addresses, phone numbers here. So check your email address to see if you got an email from AT&T. Um, they mentioned and as they disclosed this um, in, a, in a post to their own newsroom as well. Last month, they suffered a major outage infecting millions of customers towards the end of February, about one and a half million customers of the U.S.'s largest wireless provider having those outage reports here. And they talked about the data set and the robust investigation that they've launched uh, based on some cybersecurity experts. You know what, Brad? Well here. Yeah. Uh, I don't think people care about data breaches anymore. That has been the lesson. Really? Not as much as they used to. And I think it's a terrible thing. I think uh, people should care about it. But here, uh, here's Bloomberg uh, with an, uh, a hot take. AT&T is unlikely to suffer lasting damage to its brand or subscriber account for, uh, from a significant security breach that exposed the 7.6 million current subscribers, 65 uh, million former users. T-Mobile, and this is a classic example here, suffered a series of similar breaches over the past three years with little to no impact on its brand reputation or operating performance. So uh, probably just uh, sleep this one off here. I am looking at the year-to-date price action on the Wi-Fi Interactive and pretty, pretty choppy chart, chart as I'm seeing it there. Let me just show you the last 10 years. That is a, a slow trend down. And if I put a max on, though, you can see we are actually touching $15 support way back from the 1990s. Is that going to hold? Well, I wouldn't hold my breath, but nevertheless, that potential is there. 
Now, uh, we want to take a look at another trending picture. This is Delta Airlines. They're getting named a top pick at Morgan Stanley, reiterating their overweight rating and raising their price target to $85 from $77. The analyst behind the call is saying Delta's push in a premium will be rewarded by investors. And uh, just taking a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive one more time here, uh, I am showing here. Let's do the year-to-date first so we can see. Yeah, we did get some liftoff. We talk about the broadening of the rally. Well, we we got that in March here, but if you take a look at the five-year chart, you can see really pretty much at the upper end of a potential rain. This was the pandemic drop, by the way, and it has touched this number once, twice. It's three times a charm. We'll have to see, but if not, probably heads back down to thirty dollars. Yeah, Morgan Stanley is not uh, new to this, or at, they're new to this call specifically and, and this pivot on Delta. But they're not the first to make a top pick analysis like this. TD Cowens, Elaine Becker, one of the first out, really looking to twenty twenty four and overall for TD Cowen naming that the top airline pick there. But I think more notably here for Morgan Stanley and assessing the attribution to premium here. Delta already being known as a premium brand and uh, really how it's able to in the wake of so many of the aircraft manufacturing woes that are taking place and impacting the entire industry capacity the routes the ability to take on aircraft that have already been ordered as well that's going to impact for for years to come some of the flight routes and schedules here delta perhaps best insulated from some of the boeing issues as they don't operate the max currently however they did also have to come out to the street and say all right well we're pushing back that delivery timeline and that target for when we're expected to take delivery of the max 10 and and thus it be inserted into the fleet and for the number of pilots that were already training on how to fly that aircraft as well here. Yeah, and I just add, uh, talking about premium brands, uh, Morgan Stanley draws an interesting comparison to Abercrombie and Fitch <laughs> yeah, in the notes. So I, I think we got to jump off here. Uh, I don't want to leave too many cliffhangers, but uh, interesting note there to read. Yeah, indeed. And today's stock to watch as well here. We're tracking UPS officially taking the place of FedEx as the United States Postal Service's primary air cargo provider. Now, FedEx said in a regulatory filing it was not able to reach mutually beneficial terms to extend the contract, which is set to expire on September 29th here. You're taking a look at the share price reactions here, I believe, pre-market, yeah. and FedEx moving lower. However, there were some analysts that had actually come out in recent months and said that this is going to be a potential positive here for, for FedEx. And here's really? why, because it actually removes them from having this burden of needing to operate with USPS, be the cargo carrier there. Um, and It implies some inefficiency in the United States exactly. Postal Service that I can't understand. Because <laughs> you cannot fathom it at all. I mean, you've got the Grinch probably back there in the back offices uh, giving everybody <laughs> jury duty. Anyway, all jokes aside, um, it's the this new tricolor initiative, and it, they say the analyst does um, over at Barclays, I believe, that it muddies the water, making it less clear how much air capacity and cost the company can reduce. So this, yeah. perhaps one of those instances that they can start to reduce cost here, um, and we'll see what type of benefit UPS gets as a result of this on the other side. Yeah, I, well, uh, just sticking on FedEx with a second, I have a reaction by Bloomberg Intelligence mm -hmm. saying they stand, FedEx stands to lose uh, close to $2 billion in revenue following the expiration of this contract we're talking about. It's their largest customer, and the company will need to restructure its network to better align assets to the lost volume to minimize the margin impact. So the loss of the business could also free up capacity for higher yielding freight like small or shippers. So I think freeing up the capacity and rejiggering the business is probably the longer term thinking there, yeah. uh, shedding a little bit of dead weight. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And how much dead weight? Well, per perhaps one and a half billion dollars worth of dead weight, according to wow. Barclays here, uh, ahead of that news being announced. Here. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Bing bong. That's the opening bell on uh, Wall Street and Midtown Manhattan. Take a look at Asperion ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ. And then Wall Street at the New York Stock Exchange. You got everybody. You got the Rangers. You got Ronald McDonald House. You got RBC Capital Markets. You got Skate with the Greats. And you got Henrik Lundqvist as well <laughs> of Rangers fame. All right. Great bell. Great bell. All right. Group clapping, cheering, funfetti, raining down at the NASDAQ. Let's begin this new quarter. Let's start it off here, taking a look. A little bit of red. Yeah, a little bit of red. The Dow Jones Industrial Average here. We've been tracking that all morning here. Yeah, and the NASDAQ hasn't printed yet, so that's from Friday or Thursday, actually. Bump let's, see, let's see if it can come to uh, market here. S&P 500 up a whopping three basis points in the Russell 2000, basically treading water as well. And let's take a look at the sector action, where we saw real estate leading in the pre-market. Not so. Uh, we do have materials. That was uh, in second or third place, followed by tech and energy. Also have uh, industrials there. And there's a year-to-date chart. Materials, by the way, uh, one of the better performing sectors has come to life with industrials and financials. We're going to talk with Neil Dutta in a second about the, rod the rally broadening. But uh, overall, communication services looking like the biggest loser of the day, only down about one-fifth of one percent. That's right. We're taking a look as well here just at the NASDAQ composite. Let's take a look at some of those mega cap tech stocks here to begin the second quarter. And we'll just put it on a year to date scale. How about that? Just to show different where some look. of the larger, a different look, right? Of course. And we've got much of the sparring around whether or not it's the Magnificent Seven, is the Fantastic Four, or whatever superlative we're going to put only on one. it. And There's only number. one NVIDIA, right? <laughs> there you go. And NVIDIA up by about 83% year to date, adding on to the massive year that was back in 2023. All right. Well, we are starting a new quarter and to kick off the first trading day of this second quarter after stocks having their best first quarter in five years, can the momentum last? That's a question we're asking. And to break down the catalysts and headwinds, investors should be on the lookout for this quarter. We bring in Neil Dutta. He is a Renaissance Macro Research. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us here, Neil. Uh, let me just ask you, we're starting a new quarter. We're coming off a lot of strength. Can this continue? <laughs> Uh, you know, I think so. I mean, um, you know, look, for me uh, as an economist, uh, you know, I, I think fundamentally what drives markets is actual and expected earnings and interest rates. OK. And, um, you know, my sense is that inflation is likely to moderate between now uh, and June, and that should put some downward pressure on interest rates. And at the same time, this is still an environment where companies can make money, which should push uh, earnings higher. So, you know, from my perspective, I think uh, there's room for, uh, for 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 equity markets to continue uh, rising here. Uh, okay. We could talk about different styles and so forth, but I mean, generally speaking, I think it's an it's an environment of of cyclical momentum. I mean, at the end of the day, guys, we're talking about how much is the economy growing, and how much are central banks cutting. Right. That's a pretty good backdrop for risk appetite. And so, so markets potentially here for the rest of the year trying to figure out are new all-time highs warranted if we see less cuts on the interest rate side than expected? What would be your expectation there and, and the perhaps um, calibration or readjustment of some of the real number of cuts that we could get? Well, why are they doing that? They're doing it because the economy is better. If the economy is better, that means earnings are higher. If earnings are higher, that means stocks should go up. To me, it's pretty, I mean, you don't want the Fed cutting too much because that ultimately means that they're trying to stem a deep earnings and economic recession. So, uh, you know, I think what, what we're talking about now, and I think that's part, that's part of the challenge is because we're so used to the Fed cutting uh, not at all or very much. And that's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about right now is a recalibration of policy because inflation is coming more under control. Uh, it's not an environment where the Fed can aggressively ease policy because the economic data simply don't, don't justify that. But if you think about uh, the unemployment rate and inflation and kind of trying to tie that into a simple kind of policy rule, uh, it, it basically suggests uh, a modest recalibration of cuts, uh, recalibration of policy, maybe two, three cuts. Uh, that's sort of where we're at right now. And I think that's the right call. So do you see this evolving as a kind of 90 scenario where the Fed was raising rates, 94, 95, ran into a little trouble in 98 around long term capital management, held off on uh, but eventually cut. Um, I, 
it just seems like the soft landing scenario is an historical aberration, and yet it's been the base case for so long. I'm just trying to wrap my head around, uh, is this an actual uh, repeat of something that is an historical aberration, that soft landing that eludes the Fed so many times? Well, I don't know that it's as much of a historical aberration as people make it out to be. Uh, you know, I think you could argue that right before COVID, the Fed, the Fed pulled off a soft landing, uh, and you mentioned the 90s. Um, you know, I don't. I think it's more like 95, frankly, than 98. I mean, I, I don't see a. I mean, you know, 98. Remember, was a per, a period where we had uh, big financial stresses coming off global um, economic and market problems, like you know. Uh, you know, Russia, LTCM, the peso crisis and all and all the rest of it. This doesn't feel like that. I mean, if anything, you know, the Fed hiked aggressively and we didn't really have much discussion of balance of payment prices in emerging markets, which is what you typically see when you have, you know, rapid Fed tightening cycles. So I think, you know, from that perspective, you know, the uh, the global economy, particularly emerging markets, are, seem a lot stronger today than they did uh, back uh, during the period that you're talking about. Um, I think the make or break factor for whether this is going to be like the 90s is really whether productivity continues its ascent. Um, you know, we've, we, we're coming off a period of very strong productivity growth. A lot of that's just driven by, um, you know, stronger demand, frankly. But, uh, you know, if we do get a little bit of capital deepening, if, um, you know, we continue to see these normalization dynamics from the pandemic, uh, productivity can be growing at a more normal rate. And that basically allows the Fed, uh, gives the mm -hmm. Fed space uh, and allows them to, uh, to recalibrate policy without having to worry about much inflation pressure. Got to ask you about Japan here. It seems like a boogeyman just hanging in the wings. Uh, we got the yen this weekend to, what, a 30-year low, and it looks like it might be pressuring the BOJ to spur some kind of action after it raised interest rates for the first time over a decade. I'm just wondering, is what concerns should we have about Japan, if any? Well, I certainly think, I mean, historically, currency interventions from the Bank of Japan have been fleeting. I mean, they've, they've led to some temporary adjustment in the currency, but they haven't really done much else. Uh, and I'd expect that this time, I mean, to the extent people are speculating about it. Obviously, there was a lot of concern over what would happen with carry trade dynamics after the Bank of Japan uh, telegraphed a hike. But, you know, it's important to remember that despite that, interest rates in Japan are substantially lower than the rest of the developed world. So, uh, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical that it would have that much of an effect on uh, on global asset markets. And that seems to be the case so far. And, and so for the companies that have the most international exposure right now, and, and specifically we've been zeroing in on, on China and the type of hit that we could see to revenue or, or even profits as there's still more of the tit for tat that's taking place. What most notably would you be watching for within that region to give a sense of just how much detriment could be incurred by the companies that have the largest international exposure? Well, I mean, companies have been diversifying away from China, some more so than others, but it's important to remember that a lot of final assembly has leaked out uh, out of China over the last number of years already. Um, you know, in terms of what investors look for, it look, should look for, I mean, in my experience, what happens really is essentially a tape bomb effect. You get some negative headlines, you get, uh, you know, political back and forth between the two countries, and that that that's what tends to weigh on, uh, on equity market prices more so than, um, you know, sort of the fundamental analysis of how much we're exporting and so forth to these countries. I mean, but, uh, you know, it's a headwind for sure. But again, as I mentioned before, um, it's important to remember that Despite all the weakness in China that we've been talking about, sentiment around China is quite weak. And emerging markets around China have been doing reasonably well, all things considered. So, um, you know, to the extent that China stabilizes here, I think it's, a, it's, it's probably a positive for the global economy. Neil, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Neil Dutta, who is the Renaissance Macro Research Head of Economics Research. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, we've got much more Yahoo Finance after the break. Stay tuned. Here's a shot of New York.
Oil posting solid gains for the first quarter of the year, but demand side headwinds that might threaten the commodity this quarter. To break this down for us, we've got Yahoo Finance's very own Inez Ferre. Hey, Inez. Hey, yeah, Brad. And let's pull up the interactive for you. Or put up the chart there so you can see where oil prices are at. We have seen oil prices this year rally in the first three months of the year. A WTI trading above $83 a barrel. Brent crude now trading around $87 a barrel. So we've had a strong quarter for oil. OPEC will have a, a smaller online uh, meeting this week. They're not expected to tamper with the production cuts that they've set so far. Uh, in June, they will have a broader, bigger meeting. And some traders are saying that you could see OPEC Plus really continuing on with their production cuts through the end of the year now. As some traders were expecting, perhaps June, they would scale something back. But now it could be through the end of the year. But as one oil trader put it to me, he said, look, uh, history shows that when oil continues to be above $80 a barrel, OPEC tends to overproduce. I also do want to mention that I spoke to one analyst recently that told me that with this whole consolidation that you're seeing in the Permian Basin, last year you saw record production. You had smaller oil producers as well contributing to that production. Well, when you have a consolidation, that kind of starts to set the tone for a controlled production, so to speak. Uh, so there is an expectation that production is going to sort of uh, be more controlled in the second half of this year. Uh, all of that is, of course, uh, bullish for prices as we speak. And, and you are also looking at XLE that had an excellent month last month and for the year, XLE up as well, guys. Yahoo Finance's very own Inez Ferre. Inez, thanks so much. Thank you. Let's switch gears here and talk a little Disney. Disney's proxy battle is heating up. The fate of Disney's board will be determined this week following activist investor Nelson Peltz's month-long battle for a boardroom shakeup. The results of the shareholder vote, they're expected to be announced at Disney's annual stockholders meeting Wednesday. For more on what we can expect, we've got Yahoo Finance's senior reporter, Alexandra Canal. Hey, Allie. Hey, Brad, that's right. We're entering the final days of this fight. Shareholders can continue to vote or change their vote until Wednesday. That's the day the polls close. And like you said, the day of that annual shareholder meeting, it's also possible that we could receive a last minute deal between Peltz and Disney. But I do think he's going to want to take this to the finish line, especially since he's received some life into these final days of the campaign. According to a press release this morning, two institutional investors, the California Public Employee Employees retirement system, along with global asset manager Newberger Berman, both expressed their support for Tryon's nominees. That includes Peltz, along with former Disney CFO Jay Rossullo. And notably, this does follow the pro Peltz recommendation we heard from proxy advisory firms ISS and Egan Jones. The ISS recommendation in particular really served as a turning point for Peltz. But we do have to remember that up to 40% of Disney shares are held by individual retail investors. And if you take a look at Disney's stock price since the start of the year, it's been a truly impressive run. And in fact, for the first quarter alone, Disney was the best year-to-date Dow performer with a stock up 35%, hovering at record highs. For its part, Disney has won the support from proxy advisory firm Glass Lewis and has also received the backing from other high-profile names like J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon, Star Wars creator George Lucas, among others. So both sides seemingly coming into this from a position of strength in, in different ways. Disney has faced a lot of challenges, including slowing demand in its park business, a lack of profitability within streaming. We've also seen some underperformers at the box office, but the company has taken steps to address some of these issues. There's been mass layoffs. There's been restructuring efforts. Disney has announced various partnerships like its deal with Epic Games, along with password sharing crackdowns, price hikes. So all of that seems to be boosting the bullish sentiment on Wall Street and Main Street, but succession still serving as a big overhang, a big question mark moving forward. That's what Peltz has really uh, hung his hat on when we think about this proxy campaign at large. So at this point, anything can really happen. It all goes down on Wednesday. That's the shareholder meeting, and it's going to be a big day for me, and I know a big day for Yahoo Finance to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, this proxy fight is even playing out in my LinkedIn feed now, Ali. So yes. we'll see which side really 
really gets the best of the shareholders' attention here. Ali, thanks so much for breaking this down. We're going to be watching this going into Wednesday. Well, let's switch gears here. Jefferies maintaining bullish on Target's reinnovation plans. Jefferies raising its price target on the stock to $205 from $195 as the healthy but cautious consumer is still spending. Let's bring in the analyst behind that call, good friend of the show, Corey Tarlow, who's the senior vice president of equity research over at Jefferies. Corey, good to see you here. Thanks for kicking off the second quarter with us. First, you got to take us into your thesis. What are you seeing at Target right now that gives you this optimism? Morning, and thanks so much for having me. So I think the most important thing to note here is that perhaps the tone around the health of the consumer in the U.S. is changing. So I think for a good period of time, the, the narrative was the consumer stretched, credit card balances are now over a trillion dollars, she's prioritizing what she needs over what she wants, but now I, I think what we're starting to see is with the moderation and in inflation, maybe there's some normalization of mix now in the consumer's basket. So she, if she's going into a store with $100 and now things like fresh fish, dairy, milk, eggs, et cetera, some fruits and vegetables are lower in price, maybe that's freeing up some incremental dollars to buy general merchandise. And so what we're starting to see now is an improvement in general merchandise uh, in, in, in Target's business, and I think perhaps an improvement around tone um, for the broader consumer generally. So I think that these are some pretty bullish signs for Target and for the U.S. consumer. Well, you mentioned freeing up some cash here. What about for uh, unit expansion, uh, investing in the store in new locations? Uh, how do you see that playing out, and what's the strategy here? Sure. So Target has about 2,000 units today, and they're growing. So the company is going to be adding over the next 10 years an aggregate of 300 new units. A lot of them are going to be in this newer format. They're going to have integrations with beauty, partnerships with Apple, Disney, Levi's, et cetera, to create excitement for the consumer. They'll have availability for Starbucks, same-day pickup. So all of these things are likely to help to continue to drive traffic to Target stores, which should mean more customers, more benefits, um, greater sales, and even perhaps better margin, too, as people maybe go to the store and pick up Starbucks, and then they add in some incremental apparel items, which, by the way, are higher margin. So I think all of this bodes very well from a unit expansion standpoint, which tends to help drive sales. And one of the things that's really important to key in on here is retailers that are expanding units tend to also uh, hold higher multiples as well. So it could be good for valuation ahead. Corey, you met with management from Target as well as Walmart. I mean, take us into the tone from both of these executive teams and what you're hearing from them right now. Sure. Um, so the tone overall was positive. Uh, I think starting grounding in my comments on the consumer being relatively healthier and more resilient than I think we had initially expected. But for Walmart, one thing I think that was particularly interesting was that for as, as I mentioned, inflation has been moderating, but for particularly for food, food inflation has been moderating um, and private label, which is a hundred billion dollar plus business for Walmart, um, is also deflationary. And specifically within private label, food and consumables private label is now running deflationary as well. So I think that this does bode really well for Walmart's private label business generally, because it means that perhaps Walmart's going to be gaining more market share. All the while, you're seeing more promotions or rollbacks on things like food and consumables. And these are vendor funded. Uh, so rollbacks were up, I think, 50% in the fourth quarter. And these promotions are becoming more broad versus item specific. So I think that that, again, really does bode well for, for share gains for Walmart ahead. Uh, Corey, we got time for one more here. Just in your broad coverage universe, any trends that you're seeing here that we didn't have a chance to uh, talk about here today in the retail market? Sure. Uh, one thing I think that's really important to key in on, it's not something a lot of people focus on, is the integration of AI in retail as we look ahead. Something that both Target and Walmart touched on. Walmart's continuing to leverage it on their AI search capabilities as well as in their supply chain. And they also mentioned that they're using it as a way to help associates or develop associates to uh, incorporate schedule updates into their into their into their days and add trainings. Um, this is important because Walmart's going to be adding 130 billion dollars in sales over the next five years on a relatively flat headcount. 
So developing their associates, leveraging technology through AI and automation is going to be really key, not only to the Walmart story, but Target as well, uh, as they continue to enhance their technology offerings more broadly. So this is something that we're going to keep following and paying attention to, but it's going to be, I think, a really key underpinning of more profitable growth ahead for retailers. What's the biggest delta in the consumer experience as a result of AI, artificial intelligence, that shoppers can expect? I think it has to do with faster service and more personalized recommendations. So if you load up a Target or Walmart app, uh, it's about curating specific results for you that, that are relevant to you as the consumer. Um, and that in turn could help drive higher sales, higher uh, conversion, um, and greater efficiency for these retailers. It also helps to get uh, goods to you more effectively. It could help with customer service and, and technology to, to integrate um, any sorts of complaints or, or thoughts around experiences, what if people want refunds, et cetera. So leveraging this technology is going to be really critical mm -hmm. uh, to driving more profitable growth ahead. And again, it, it makes it makes us really bullish on the prospects for Walmart and Target, who are relatively early adopters of AI and are using it more expansively across their business than other retailers at present. Corey, you had me at AI. Thanks for joining us here. Corey Tarlow, Senior Vice President of Equity Research at Jefferies. We're going to be right back. Investors at Citigroup appear to be becoming more cautious about the tech sector. On the heels of a rough first quarter that saw the Magnificent Seven slumping, the bank, the bank downgrading the sector to market weight from overweight, forecasting a broadening of the market and raising its uh, rating on the consumer discretionary sector to overweight. And uh, Brad, just looking at the Wi-Fi Interactive here, I just want to point out the sector action that we've seen year to date. Mm -hmm. And here's communication services that has Meta, that has Alphabet, so some people call that tech. But here's Here's number two, that is energy. Here's number three, that is financials. We only get to, then we have industrials, then we have tech. So tech is a distant five here. We've already seen this broadening out. And from what I can tell, the call on consumer discretionary is really about Tesla, and that's a valuation story. Yeah, and this, I think, charts forth a pivot that a lot of investors are probably trying to get ahead of when and if the tech 
generative AI well runs dry in yeah. this near term here. And, and more notably, I was looking back to some of the facts that earnings expectations data for Q1 earnings season here. Analysts have been less pessimistic in their estimate revisions for S&P 500 companies for the first quarter compared to recent averages. And then if you look even into tech, seven of the 11 sectors are projected to report year over year earnings growth led by utilities and information technology plus community services. You mm -hmm. just mentioned two of those sectors yeah. here. So most notably, I think it's still a larger question of where are you going to see the most margins continue to come through at the same time where all investors are probably going to have to start thinking about where they take profits and reinvest that elsewhere, perhaps for uh, a greater gain to be expected and realized. Yeah, nothing much to add there. I think in general, uh, we're going to see a lot of incoming calls here as it's become uh, as it becomes more obvious that the rally has broadened out and that these supporting sectors to the AI trade, and we're seeing that in uh, the infrastructure of the AI, that's the AI. That's something we haven't talked about a lot, but I think we're going to see a lot more of that as well in the days and weeks to come. Yeah, well, Jared asked me in the last break, yes. why are you still here? <laughs> Guess what, folks? I'm leaving the desk for an hour to be replaced by our Madison Mills here from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Don't Despair going to be back for Wealth at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You guys get a great hour coming up here, too. Yeah, that's right. Until then, we're going to have much more here on Yahoo Finance. In the next hour, we will deep dive into the market's reaction to Friday's key inflation print. We're also going to look ahead to jobs data on Friday. Plus, we will talk to the IPO market and the fate of the Magnificent Seven. That interview you don't want to miss. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Madison Mills alongside Jared Blickery. We are about 30 minutes into today's trading day. So we're going to get a quick check on the market action. We just got that stronger than expected data in when it comes to uh, the ISM here coming in at 50.3 versus 48.3. So potentially going to see some movement when it comes to the market on that. We're seeing the NASDAQ and the S&P up here. Uh, the Dow Jones still struggling to get some traction down by about four tenths of a percent. Just to repeat that, ISM manufacturing data beating all expectations coming in at 50.3 versus the 48.3 expectation, which is particularly surprising given that some of the indications that we had from the regional players in the space were that we were potentially going to have a downside risk to this number. So interesting to see that we've got that hotness in this print leading to potentially some more strength and the conviction behind our strong economy. We've also got a busy week ahead with us. We got data and events coming up here in the week ahead that could potentially move markets. First, we're getting a flurry of employment data on deck, starting with the jolts data coming out on Tuesday. We also have ADP's private payrolls report on Wednesday. That gives us some info about the jobs market. We've got weekly unemployment claims, of course, on Thursday. And then we've got the big March jobs report on Friday. We've also got a ton of Fed speak throughout the week, including more from Powell coming up on Wednesday. In company news, though, we're going to have all eyes on Disney's annual stockholders meeting on Wednesday. Shareholders will finally find out who won the proxy fight between the entertainment giant and activist investor Nelson Peltz. Stocks starting off 2024 on a high note as investors are digesting the latest economic data here. Still seen relatively flat on the S&P. Some strength, though, in the NASDAQ after that flat month of March. Uh, again, getting that manufacturing data in this coming as the Fed's preferred inflation gauge PCE did come in line with expectations, rising 2.8 percent in February. So what does all of this mean for the Fed's rate cut path? Joining us now is Christina Hooper, Invesco Chief Global market strategist. And Christina, thank you so much for being here. Talk to me about the data that we're getting in this morning, particularly this hotter than expected ISM print. Does that move the needle on any of your thinking or your calls at all? It doesn't. It's certainly comforting to get that print. Um, what it tells us is that the economy is likely better than many had thought. I mean, certainly it's just one data point, but the new order sub-index was better than expected, which suggests that the future looks bright as well. What's important, though, to recognize is the employment sub-index, sub which was tepid, it was actually slightly lower than expected. And that suggests that the economy is doing well, but not at the expense of higher inflation, which is critical when we think about the Fed's path. Because what we've heard from Jay Powell over and over again is that he doesn't need to see a deterioration in the economy in order to cut rates. What he's focused on is the inflation data. And so everything that I'm seeing today coming out suggests that we are still on target for a Fed rate cut by the end of the second quarter. All right. And let's think ahead to Friday now. What would you need to see in the jobs market to disturb that point of view? In other words, uh, what makes the what changes the needle? What moves the needle for the Fed on this Friday where we're expecting payrolls once again to be north of 200,000? So I don't think that a higher than expected payroll number will move the needle for the Fed and cause them to be more apprehensive about rate cuts. What I do think could make the Fed more apprehensive is a higher than expected average hourly earnings. That is the metric that is most important to me in that Friday jobs report. And quite frankly, every monthly jobs report. It's about average hourly earnings because that's wage growth and that could have a significant impact on inflation. What I've seen thus far would suggest to me that we won't see any significantly higher than expected number, but that's the critical um, data point to look at. Well, beyond the data points, we also have the kind of global race to figure out inflation and, of course, potential rate cuts on the table. I know that you called the Swiss National Bank's moves potentially a trend that's going to move the global markets when it comes to rate cuts. Could that be a domino effect that then moves maybe the BOE? And then does that tip the Federal Reserve at all? What's the read through like? 
Absolutely. I think that what we're seeing is central banks um, beginning that process of starting to normalize. Um, for the Bank of Japan, that's something else uh, in terms hmm. of normalizing. That's actually hiking. But for for the, the majority of um, major developed central banks, it's about starting to cut. Although what the Swiss National Bank decision signifies is that they're looking inward at their economy and saying that it qualifies uh, for a rate cut. And I think we're just going to see the same thing happen with other major central banks, that they'll look inward and say, um, hey, this is appropriate given what we're seeing in terms of inflation and economic growth. Um, and uh, and uh, they will, though, uh, feel more comfortable because other central banks are doing the same thing. I mean, what we saw was a synchronized, um, a, a period of very synchronized uh, rate hikes uh, starting in 2022. And now I think we'll see the opposite in terms of, of um, significant synchronicity in rate cuts. All right. You mentioned Japan a minute ago, so I want to bring up Japan again. Um, decidedly asynchronous with the rest of the world's banks, uh, central banks, because they just raise their rates, as you mentioned as well. Um, this seems to be a ticking time bomb, and the Japanese, the BOJ, has introduced half measures in the, in the past that traders seem to have laughed off within minutes or hours. Uh, what's the risk here for investors in America, in the U.S., with respect to Japanese interest? Interest rate policy, uh, if any, if any, at that matter. I don't think there's any significant risk to U.S. investors. I think that this is actually a time when U.S. investors should be looking. Um, to opportunities outside the U.S. for investment, and that includes Japanese equities. What we saw coming from the Bank of Japan last week was uh, a very, very dovish hike. Um, so the Bank of Japan was giving something of a vote of confidence in the Japanese economy and certainly was emboldened by the wage increases um, that came about um, in the recent labor negotiations. Uh, so there's a feeling that the Japanese economy economy is normalizing, and so we can, in fact, hike rates, but very gently. And uh, so I think the message is a positive one and, uh, and one that may encourage U.S. investors to look outside the U.S. to areas like Japan for investment. Well, let's end on China then, because it's obviously had a lot of volatility. Uh, and I know that you see potential opportunity in China for investors. But I wonder about the risk. There are many there, but the risk of regulation in particular. Is the potential for the U.S. to sort of freeze out China already priced into the market? I certainly think that sentiment has been over, negative sentiment is completely overblown. So I would say uh, risks are are overpriced in um, to Chinese equities. I've argued that for a while. And what we got was um, very positive PMI data. And uh, as a result, what we've seen overnight is that it was a positive catalyst for equities. And so that underscores um, the upside risks that that upside potential that comes um, when when stocks are oversold. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Always appreciate you stopping by here. Christina Hooper, Invesco Chief Global Market Strategist. Thank and, you. And U.S. markets have surged during Biden's president. Presidency, the S&P 500 up about 40 percent as we settle into its fourth year. Now we want to know how does it compare to stocks under former President Trump and how should investors consider this heading into the 2024 election? election. Joining us now on this is Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman. Rick, latest issue. Hey guys. Thank you. Bidenomics, go. Where are we? <laughs> uh, yeah, the stock market is one of the stats I track for the Yahoo Finance Bidenomics report card. How is Biden doing on the economy compared with uh, prior presidents going all the way back to Jimmy Carter in the 1970s? Uh, and this, there's been an interesting flip in the in the last month or two as we've had this uh, going on what's like a six month uh, stock rally here. So for most of Biden's presidency, when you compare the S and P 500 under Trump with the S and P under Biden, um, the stock market was doing better under Trump. But now that we're in the fourth year of each president's term, if you if you compare uh, the stock market under Biden with Trump at the same point in his presidency. Um, Biden is blowing Trump away at this point. S&P 500 up about 40 percent since Biden took office. 
And at this point in Trump's presidency, the S&P 500 was only up about 13 percent. So 40 percent under Biden, only 13 percent under Trump. And there's a big reason. Uh, stocks were doing well under Trump until the COVID pandemic erupted uh, in February and March of 2020. So that was basically four years ago. We got a, a big downturn in the market. We had a deep but short recession. And then stocks recovered under Trump. But uh, I, if, if, if stocks just stay flat for the rest of Biden's term, he will still beat Trump on the stock market. Does this matter? Well, I'll tell you who it matters to. It matters to Donald Trump because he has said more than once, he said in 2020, well, if you elect General uh, Joe Biden, uh, the stock market's going to crash. It did not crash. And then Trump even recently has said, well, the only reason stocks are going up is because of me, uh, because uh, investors are happy that I'm I'm the I'm going to be the Republican presidential nominee and probably be president again. So therefore, uh, investors are uh, happy about the prospect of a second Trump economy. I don't buy that. I don't think many people do. Uh, but there are some bragging rights at stake here. As there are. And we're going to be watching that DJT ticker as well. But that's a story for another day. Thank you, Rick Newman. Bye, guys. And we're watching shares of Micron ticking higher this morning after Bank of America boosted its price target on the chip maker. The analyst forecasting demand for high bandwidth memory chips is going to grow to more than $20 billion by 2027. And Maddie, I'm just looking at the Wi-Fi interactive here. I like to think in market prices and we have a heat map with semiconductors. Mm -hmm. Here's Micron up 47 percent. You can wow. see that's a, a little bit more than half of Nvidia's rise there. Uh, but let me just pull up a five year chart of Micron. Uh, interesting that after it was able to push above this resistance, which looks like a backwards cup and handle, I haven't seen that before, but after it was able to push through, it has been off to the races. You can really see that in the year to day, just having taken off over the last couple of weeks alone there. Well, it's really interesting to see what it's doing to the market this morning because we're seeing that Samsung and uh, SK Hynix, part of the, the competitors to Micron, are moving on the news. We have Samsung down a little bit. SK Hynix is up. Uh, Having said that, it's interesting to get this call, particularly given that Micron, as you mentioned, has already had a lot of growth. When I think about how they did after their earnings print, they saw the biggest rally since 2011. That was when they, on March 21st, did boost their AI rally, uh, rally outlook, rather. Uh, so seeing that AI rally kind of expanding beyond NVIDIA into some of these other names, yeah. the big question, of course, whether or not anyone is going to be able to beat NVIDIA. I mean, it, at the end of the day, Micron is a totally different chip company than NVIDIA. These are apples to oranges, but uh, you have these laggards. And if the industry, the push, the hype is big enough, you got to think that there's going to be a lot of catch up and a lot of games of catch up as well. I love it. All right. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
We are kicking off the second quarter of the year today after the first quarter sent all three major indices to record highs. But this month could potentially see the rally start to peter out here. April is traditionally a strong month for markets, but that strength could stall into May, and that has happened historically during election years. So to break down what we might expect this spring, we've got John Colovos, Macro Risk Advisors, Head of Technical Strategy here. John, thank you so much for joining us. I want to talk about kind of the technicals that you pointed out about April. As I mentioned, April, a really strong month, but we tend to see some of that strength waning in election years. So I'm curious, help me understand the dichotomy between those two things. Why is that disconnect there? Yeah, you, you got it. And thanks for having me. Yeah, well, the way I'm looking at the seasonals here in the market is, you know, choose your own adventure, so to speak. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, presidential years, uh, April tends to be a flattish sort of month, which leads into quite a, a negative May. Uh, but if you look at all Aprils, Aprils actually is a pretty strong month, up around 2% on average for over the last 30 years. I think the reasoning behind that is, is that, you know, elections breed uncertainty and that tends to be a, a moment in time, you know, this this window period leading into the summer doldrums and so on and so forth. Folks tend to de-risk ahead of um, election uncertainties. And John, let me ask you about small caps here. On the Wi-Fi Interactive, I have uh, Russell 2000. This is a three-year chart, and if you can't see it, all I'm going to do is highlight the incredible con uh, the sideways price action that we had for years, which it has finally broken out of to the upside here. Um, just based on this alone or any other factors that you look at when you look at the markets, what do you think of the small cap space here? Uh, so I could see the chart, and basically yes. there's an old saying in the technical land, right? Bigger the base, higher into space it goes. And it. That is a very, very big base that it's, it's breaking out of. Uh, so what happened at the end of uh, March was that we had two consecutive months above that breakout level that you had drawn, right? That gives us more confidence in that base breakout. And the, the count, the technical objective of that breakout is to all-time highs for small caps. Another, I'm doing the math top of my head, another 15% from recent levels. So very, very constructive when you see that sort of base breakout. And really what that's telling us, you know, I don't want to get too crazy about patterns. Mm -hmm. It's telling us that there's a transition, right? A, a downtrend to uptrend sort of transition, this stalemate between supply and demand, right? It's breaking in favor of more robust demand for smaller cap stocks. Does that mean that we are just beginning a catch up in the small caps trade? Yeah, it would. It would. It would imply that for sure that there is um, a, a bit of a catch up. So the way I've been writing it in my work is, is that the trends that matter most are positive, like the S&P 500. The trends that we'd like to have are about ready to gain escape velocity. Right. So the S&P 500 is really what drives the market. It's what people's benchmark is. Now, these smaller cap stocks are now joining, if you will, uh, the, the broader equity market. So it's 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 a healthy thing in terms of stocks as an asset class. But yeah, I would say that they're just starting to join. Historical studies that I've done that have gone back to data into the 1930s has suggested all along that small caps tend to follow large caps higher. So this is kind of par for the course-ish. You know, it should have happened a little sooner, but it's happening nonetheless. All right, and jumping back to the large cap space, I want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive again, where I have the 11 S&P 500 sectors as re represented by ETFs. This is a year-to-date analysis. So communication services, which has Meta and also Alphabet, some people call that tech, that's in the lead. But then we have energy, then we have financials, then we have the S&P 500, which is up 10%, then we have industrials, and only then do we have tech. I'm just wondering, we, and materials right behind there. So given the strength that we're seeing in these other sectors, do you think there's too much talk about the concentration? Just wondering what your point of view is here. Yeah, it's got it's got much better. And, and, and you're absolutely right by pointing that out. Uh, if you think about last year, everyone was just dismissing the equity market saying, oh, it's just a couple of stocks, right? Well, guess what? Now we have more than just a couple of stocks driving the equity market higher. So it's it's a good thing, from at least from a technical perspective. Uh, what, what it actually has started to, to do in my work, at least from the models that I have, it's, it's telling us to, hey, maybe make some room for other stocks. Do add some of those energy names, some of those material names on, 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 on the, the moves of these commodities like copper and gold. Make some room for them. I call them chart diversifiers. Right? It, it can't have everything up and to the right in your portfolio. You need to have those that are going to get that relative performance handoff 
And we're seeing that with, with, with energy. Industrials have been strong all along. They've been really good. Another area you, I guess you can think about in terms of things broadening out, this year it's really just been about financials, X banks, insurance, capital markets, et cetera. But a lot of those bank stocks are starting to catch a bit as well. I'm curious because you mentioned gold. I know that we spent a lot of time focusing on the Magnificent Seven, but I've wondered if we're kind of missing out on this commodities rally. What do you think mm -hmm. investors should know now who are looking at what's happening with energy, cocoa, gold, and thinking that they might want to start to diversify into those asset classes? Okay, a couple of things, right? One is it's a bigger picture. I, I do think commodities are in a secular bull market, right? So meaning the low that occurred in 2020 was likely the low for years and years and years and years to come. Mm. Uh, the longer term implication of that is, is that stocks and commodities tend to not trend together, right? They tend to move opposite each other. We're not quite there yet where commodity prices have ripped so much where it's like an we'll have an echo inflationary boom. I think that's what most folks are worried about. So about gold, I like gold. I think gold gets to 2,500. I like gold more than the gold miners. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, is that well, gold is at, at 10,000 year highs right now, right? Whereas gold stocks are barely off of their 52 week lows. Uh, but again, longer term, they really haven't added much alpha to one's portfolio of gold miners. Have some from a tactical perspective, but I like gold more than the gold miners. And as for uh, oil and energy stocks, yeah, I, th I think they're, they're quite strong and they do have a place from one's portfolio. But again, I just want to just, just, just tell clients, uh, to viewers, I should say, is that at some point it mm -hmm. will become a headwind for stocks. Maybe it's oil above 100 that really spooks folks out. But as of right now, it it's, doesn't seem to be an issue. And we didn't even get to Bitcoin, but <laughs> I've got to say thank you. Uh, lots of insight there. Really learned something. John Colovos, Macro Risk Advisors, Head of Technical Strategy. All your markets, action is ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action with step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
CEOs are back with both Reddit and Astera Labs seeing double digit gains in their debuts. And then we have the Renaissance IPO ETF now setting up over 40% in the last year. The jumps have left a lot of people wondering about the possibility of a stock market bubble to come, but our next guest saying the signs are not there just yet. Jessica Rabe, Data Trek co founder, joining us now to discuss. Thank you so much for being here, Jessica. Uh, Jared here just had the Wi Fi Interactive pulled up and showed me that Reddit is back to its first day price when it comes to the action on Reddit here. So I am curious from your perspective, does that indicate to you that this current IPO landscape is not that different from what we've seen over the past year plus ish with the Birkenstocks of the world, the other companies that have you know gone public and then eventually seen a return to their first day trading price? Yeah, com uh, companies and IPOs certainly don't do well during their first year of trading. Uh, professional investors know that, and that's why they need to be convinced we're in a bull market in order to buy them. Wall Street calls this the IPO window, which are specific periods of time when companies can and do go public. They can't just go public whenever they want. The IPO window is finally starting to open after a long drought. That's because, like you said at the, the top of this segment, it's partly because relatively new public companies that have IPO'd within the last three years have finally recovered from 2022's bear market. The IPO ETF is up 50% over the last year. That's a, that's a big move. That's one standard deviation better than average. But equity investors certainly want to see that this sustained momentum to know they can make money from newly minted public companies. So is the signal then, uh, given the, the relative success, at least on a short term basis, you look at those opening day pops on Reddit, Reddit and um, some of the others that we've gotten recently, that's what grabs the headlines. Um, and, but it also sends a message, I think, to other issuers that maybe the waters are clearing here where do you see the market for IPOs? Is it just going to come roaring back? Is it going to be when fits and starts? How do you see the flows? Yeah, that's a great point. So as you said, uh, two of the most recent notable tech IPOs, Astaire Labs and, and Reddit, their debut performances were certainly reminiscent of frothier times, like in the late 1990s or 2021. From their IPO price through their first day of trading, they were up 50 and 70%. Now the mean first uh, the mean first day equal weighted IPO return back to 1980 is 19 percent, but it got as high as 70 percent in 1999 during the dot com bubble, and it was up 30 to 50 percent from 2020 to 2022. Uh, however, we don't yet have the volume of of IP IPOs to indicate a bubble. So, for example, there are up. There were as many as almost five, 500 IPOs during 1999, and there were a little over 300 during the pandemic-driven speculative uh, tech bubble in, in 2021. There were only about 30 IPOs last quarter, so at that run rate, we're, we're not yet... Uh, there's not enough volume to signal a genuine uh, market bubble like we've seen in the past. So what will be the catalyst to increase that volume? Yeah, so I think the more that we see public companies have successful debuts and more importantly, follow on trading activity, the more public companies or the more companies will come public. Over the last few years, startups have received hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in funding from VCs. So there's certainly many, many startups that would love to go public and especially investors that want that want those exits. But it does take time to ready a company for an IPO. So equity markets need to stay strong for quite for quite a while in order to see the uh, the activity commonly associated uh, with bubbles. You know, you mentioned a, a, 
a market statistic early on today, and I just want to match it with another one, which is that in the average first year, uh, in the average returns for a first year IPO, uh, that IPO, that ticker will tend to undercut its first day of trading 95% of the time. And so it just tells me that there's no rush for investors who might see one of these flashy IPOs to jump in right away. Just wondering what the criteria is, might be for investors who are looking to dabble in the market. Uh, what might they see in an IPO that finally gives them the green light to uh, trade it? Yeah, that's a very important point. I think it's super important for your viewers to do a lot of homework. These are uh, companies that go public. They're new to markets. They're, they're starting to understand how to communicate with investors. They're a lot more volatile than your average uh, you know, traditional stock. This is not like trading NVIDIA or Apple. They're a lot more volatile and they're a lot more difficult to trade. So we would definitely advise a lot of caution with any, with any IPO. All right. We're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you stopping by. Jessica Rabe, DataTrek co-founder. Thank you. And California fast food companies facing a new obstacle today as the FAST Act takes effect. Now, fast food chains that have at least 60 locations nationwide now need to raise their minimum wage for restaurant employees to $20 per hour. That's up from $16 per hour. Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma has all the details. Brooke. Good morning to you both. I mean, certainly this is just impacting fast food companies that have a nationwide presence, more than 60 locations, but they will only be raising their minimum wages based upon this legislation in California. It does go into, into effect in that state today, raising that minimum wage to $20 an hour. But this has been looming for so many restaurants that have a big presence in California. And those with the largest include names that we go to that we uh, visit that we talk about almost every day like Starbucks like McDonald's Jack in the Box Taco Bell Subway among so many others and companies really here had two options they could either absorb that wage increase like Cava did or they could pass along higher prices like Chipotle suggested that they would choose to do but companies that are better positioned to withstand this latest headwind include companies that have strong branding power strong value proposition and a diverse geographic footprint. And some of those companies you can see that we're fighting through now, Wendy's, McDonald's, Burger King, they tend to have a, a better position to withstand this latest, latest wage increase in California. Because of their sheer scale, that's a plus with national and international locations. Chipotle has this strong value proposition where you can get a $9 burrito bowl uh, with chicken in it across the country. And they also have good traffic as of late. Wingstop has really been ramping up their brand awareness. This will put them in a better position. And Domino's, they have what analyst, one analyst called an unbeatable low price pizza deal that will ultimately help them uh, with this latest wage increase. But Jack in the Box, they have about 43% of their restaurants in California, 60% of their subsidiary Del Taco locations are in California. And also their diners tend to skew lower income. And we know that that is one income cohort that has been slightly pulling back uh, at fast food restaurants as of late. So they are not as best positioned. They're not worse positioned, but definitely going to face some struggle here to offset that higher minimum wage cost. So, Brooke, given that this is coming in an inflationary time period where restaurants have already been trying to find ways to beef up their profit margins, I'm curious what your sources have told you about any job cuts yeah. that could come off the back of this news. Yeah, well, I did speak to one franchise owner who said that this will cost him 470000 additional dollars annually. And and so he has to let go some workers. That's what he's choosing to do. He even said that he might pull out of California entirely. Wow. He is a franchise owner of Cinnabon and Auntie Anne's. Whereas other uh, analysts have told me that job losses, they don't expect it to be widespread. They said that restaurants are just returning to those pre-pandemic staffing levels. And so they don't want to necessarily cut jobs that they just got back. But what we could see here is how does automation play into all this? Will companies be upping the investment? Because when you think about $20 an hour, how does that compare to the cost to invest in technology to implement automation to offset the labor costs? Right now, as wages increase, we're seeing that cost sort of level Arms out race. here. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, that's a great point, Brooke. Thank you so much, as always, for bringing us your reporting. We really appreciate it so much. Our very own Brooke De Palma there. Now, coming up, we're going to be looking at the tech sector's performance during the first quarter that we just wrapped up. We're going to tell you what it means about what's to come. That's coming up after the break.
Today is the beginning of the second quarter for 2024, with U.S. major averages coming off a very strong start to the year, largely driven by that rally in tech. Maybe one name in particular, they're driving it as well. But the dominance of the Magnificent Seven does appear to be starting to wane, at least as several other names are starting to show some positive upside, while others in the Mag Seven are starting to slow down. So, Jared, I know you've yes. been watching this closely, and I'm curious from your perspective, what can you tell us about just the shift that we've seen in the MAG-7 so far this year? Well, it's nothing sudden, uh, but it does speak as to a trend. And let's go not to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I actually have a, a graphic here at C. Mag there you go. Magnificent 7 market cap. This is how much they've changed or grown or shrunk in market cap this year. Leading the pack is NVIDIA. That's up over a trillion. Then you have Meta and Microsoft and Amazon. The next three are up over 300 billion. Then Alphabet. Alphabet was negative until very recently. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty bullish on the technical setup in, Alf in Alphabet oh. over the next few years. So uh, I would almost, inc I would say the Mag 5 is probably what we need here. Yeah, you can get rid of Tesla. You can get rid of Apple due to their underperformance. Apple down $346 billion. Um, but these are vastly different companies anyway. And to put them in the same bucket never really made that sense, made mm -hmm. much sense, except that they were all performing well and it happened to be together. I want to show one other chart here. This is the Mag 7 versus the Mag 4. And that Mag 4 is NVIDIA, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon. On. And you can see since the beginning of 2023, up 156% versus 96% for that MAG4. Uh, and that's really just because Apple and Tesla have been a drag on performance. But I should note, too, that both of those handily, handily beat the performance that we've seen in the S&P 500, in the NASDAQ 100, and all the other major indices. Well, Jared, I'm really curious about what you said, though, about what you're seeing with Alphabet when it comes to the technicals and mm -hmm. some bullish signals ahead. because. Alphabet has really been struggling this year as it definitely is lagging in the yes. AI race. So what are you seeing? Well, let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I do have an Alphabet chart here. This is year to date. So you can see, indeed, just based on what's happened this year, mm -hmm. uh, it is a lot of sideways action. However, you can see it's just broken above a trading range. Now, if I go to a three-year view, what excites me is this. This is a large cup. This is a little handle. And we have just broken to the upside. Given the length of this consolidation, which is over two years, you would expect a lot of follow through to the upside. So that's really just the basis of my call here. And that's just based solely on technicals. I love technicals. Thank you. I'm, under, I'm converting <laughs> people. So I'm always looking for new, uh, new subjects. I'm ready. <laughs> All right. Investors are keeping their eyes on the tech sector. As the first, first quarter of the year comes to a close with some names in the Magnificent Seven that we've been talking about showing signs of a slowdown. First three months of 2024 saw shares of Apple falling 11 percent and Tesla dropping nearly 30 percent. Alphabet shares rebounding now, but they have remained at lows for the, for the majority of the quarter. And then for the remaining four, NVIDIA, Meta, Amazon and Microsoft, they are continuing their run and are still still outpacing the broader market. So let us bring in now Bob O'Donnell, tech, uh, technical analysis, technalysis, research president and chief analyst. And uh, let's just get your, your firsthand blush. What is the discussion regarding concentration? Is it overblown? Are we overthinking this? Your thoughts on the MAG-7 or MAG-4? No, hey, thanks, Jared. Thanks for having me. Um, look, you know, the AI train is moving full blast ahead. And obviously the people who are most directly associated with that, I think is are gonna to continue to benefit. So it's gonna be the NVIDIAs, it's gonna be the AMDs. You know, lately we've started to see some of their suppliers, some of the people who provide the memory chips for them, the Microns, the Samsungs, the SK Hynixes. Uh, it's, you know, all the cloud guys are very much involved with AI, hence your Microsoft, your Alphabet slash Google, uh, and your Amazon. Um, you know, and we're gonna to start to see other enterprise software companies start to, I think, move forward as well. Oracle has been uh, making a big play there as well. I mean, Adobe's had a bit of a tough time. And I, you know, I was at their conference last week and they're talking about a theme that I'm hearing a lot lately, which is, hey, 2023 was a year of experimentation for Gen AI and businesses. 2024 is the year of implementation. And so, and we're starting to see companies do that. And they talked about bringing, you know, they have Gen AI and their creative products like Photoshop and Illustrator and Premiere, but now they're bringing it to the other side of the house, which does the management, uh, 
uh, and tracking of all this stuff. They have a product called Gen Studio. They just, I was just at their conference, like I said, last week. And, you know, we're seeing examples like this all over the place of these companies who've been longtime tech players uh, really driving forward. You also have the big data companies, the people like Snowflake, like uh, Cloudera and some of these other companies who are involved with helping companies prep their data to be used with generative AI. So all the different piece parts that lead to that generative AI engine, I think we're going to continue to see long-term growth. You know, there may be some stumbles in the short term on a couple of these, but I think longer term, it's still a good story. Well, talk to me about the degree of the long term, because there's been some division in the commentary on the street when it comes to the uptick in AI, particularly with regard to chips. Is that kind of a one time purchase that we're going to see a surge in over the course of, let's say, the next year? Or does it have legs moving into, let's say, the next decade even? Well, it's a great question, Madison. I mean, look, you know, the one thing is NVIDIA's got 90% share, right? Anybody who's got 90% share is going to lose a little share, but that doesn't mean they still can't grow, you know, organically from where they are. It's just you're going to see a lot more competitors. So if we look at it collectively, I still think there is several years of growth in the collective semiconductor market for AI powered stuff. And so you're going to see, as I said, I talked about AMD. Of course, the, you know, there's Intel. Intel will be interesting to see. Of course, their foundry business is a whole other animal to discuss separately. Qualcomm's got some AI stuff. We've got some smaller players involved as well doing AI chips for embedded cars. This is where we see ARM, who does the IP for these chips, also benefiting from all of this, uh, you know, that, that whole spectrum on the semiconductor side. You know, anytime we see a new hype cycle in a, in a promising technology, and AI certainly fits, fits a bill, you see a couple of leaders, sometimes only one, really race to the head of the pack, and then you see a game of catch up, but not all the laggards eventually catch up. And in fact, there's a pretty big bifurcation a lot of times. You have winners, you have losers. Um, so in this game where we have the clear leaders, now we're playing a game of Check, catch up with some laggards. How do you differentiate those? It's a great question. And, you know, there's not necessarily an easy answer to that. I mean, look, the bottom line is there are some companies who are going to be really, really focused on the AI piece of things. And I think you're going to see a lot more companies who are just trying to, you know, catch themselves if they can to that fast moving train. And those companies may not see the kind of benefits and they, be, they may be in the long run, the ones that have other challenges, but some of them again are diversifying and AI is actually a tiny piece of their business. I mean, I talk about Intel. Intel doesn't have any NPUs for now uh, and we'll see what they do, but they are looking at building out that foundry business, which is a whole new opportunity working with some of the cloud guys. So, you know, we may just see a different focus as some of these tech companies who've been a little bit directed towards AI, maybe moving away from AI into other areas. Because remember, there's more to, a to tech than AI. I mean, yes, AI is the big story now and everybody wants to talk about it and be associated with it, but there are still traditional other elements that are going to be part of this. And tech is just more and more embedded into our lives, into the automotive market, into smart home, into factory automation. All of these things are still going to benefit from the tech that we see from a lot of these sort of more peripheral players of, from the AI perspective. A lot of what you just mentioned makes me think about Apple, and we know that Apple has had a tougher year to date than a lot of its peers. Um, is the Apple dip still investable? You know, I, it's a great question. I mean, it's been hard to bet against Apple at all for the last decade or so, and even at times when you thought maybe, uh, you know, it was something was going to happen, they managed to pull themselves out of it. It's a little harder this time, right? I mean, now you've got the concerns in China, you've got all the uh, the DOJ stuff, you've got the EU actions, you know, they they've killed the car project. Uh, they do have. Uh, the you know the headset, but we'll see. I mean, I think that's going to be more modest than some people initially predict. Uh, and and we haven't seen anything dramatic. I, you know, I'd love to see them do a foldable iPhone. I, I think that's something that the market would be interested in. Something different. So I'm hoping that Apple will pull some some rabbits out of its hat. It's it's done so in the past, and I'm not convinced it can't do that now. But I think in the next couple quarters, it is going to be tough. All right, Bob. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. That was Bob O'Donnell, Tech Analysis Research President and Chief Analyst. We are going to have all of your markets action right here ahead, so stay tuned for more. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day.
We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. United Airlines is asking pilots to take unpaid time off next month. The company blaming Boeing's aircraft's delays for the move. In a statement delivered to Yahoo Finance, United Airlines said the forecasted block of hours for 2024 has been reduced and pilots are being offered voluntary programs for the month of May to reduce staffing. This is now the latest example of how Boeing's issues are impacting its customers. But I do also want to point out this is not the only issue that's been weighing on the number of flights offered by United, Jared. We also know that the FAA has been weighing curbing the number of routes the United Airlines is offering because they've had a slew of safety mishaps to their own right as well on flights. So potentially seeing not just the Boeing situation as a headwind, but also just their own safety issues is something that could curb the number of flights they're offering. Yeah, and just bottom line on 50% of that, and we're, I'm talking about the uh, not receiving as many planes as they had anticipated. United was contracted to receive 43 Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes. That's 43. They only got 37. 
34 max nines and they only got 19 and that's just a huge shortfall and it just goes to show how disruptive uh, Boeing has been as a player in the aviation industry and I just want to show on the Wi-Fi interactive I have a travel reopening map um, you can see uh, love is up about 24 basis points that's one quarter of a percent today but here's the year to day totals this is what I find fascinating here's Delta really no exposure to uh, these particular planes although they do have some exposure that's up 21%. Southwest up 1%. Mm. United 17, less than Delta, and uh, goes on. Alaska, well, that was uh, the seat of the problems, the most recent problems. That's up about 11%. So it spills over into stock prices as well. Sure. Well, it's interesting to see United up on this news, potentially some uh, indication that folks are encouraged that they are invoking some sort of cost-cutting measures off of this news. But having said that, we do want to give our viewers a final check of the markets as we start to wrap our show up for the day. So we're going to take a look at the major indices here, seeing the S&P 500 down two tenths of a percent on the day, mirroring what we're seeing in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That's down about six tenths of a percent here. The Nasdaq holding on to some gains, but just barely. It's basically flat when it comes to the trade there, but tipping into the green nonetheless. And when I take a look at the uh, pie when it comes to the S&P, it's just an absolute uh, red pizza sea of red here. So seeing a lot of negativity. Red pizza, Red to 11 a.m. I know. Right. Well, both our stomachs are grumbling, <laughs> so we're going to hopefully get some lunch solve this here. But coming up, we've got our new show, Wealth, that's dedicated to all of your personal finance needs. Our very own Brad Smith coming back. He has you for the next hour, so stay tuned for more. Well, earning it, 
growing it and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. On today's show, planning for retirement, why the 60-40 model might not work for you long term. And a joint bank account might seem smart, but maybe it's not always the right move. Plus, should you max out your 401k, or are there other accounts you should fund first? All of that straight ahead. Welcome to Wealth, I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. Our community of experts will give you the resources, the tools, the tips, and the tricks that you need to grow your money. Your wealth theme for today, risk and opportunity, from investment traps that you need to avoid to the tricky business of relationships and money. We'll take a look at how you can be best positioned to manage your finances and your life. Making the right investment decision, it is not easy. And while there's no one size fits all playbook for investing, making smart investment decisions can help you get one step closer to achieving your financial goals. Now, every once in a while, investors will make poor decisions and fall into some investment traps that could cost you thousands of dollars. To break down what investment traps you need to avoid, I'm joined by George Kamel, who is the host of the George Kamel YouTube channel, co-host of The Ramsey Show, and the author of Breaking Free from Broke, The Ultimate Guide to More Money and Less Stress. There you see the cover of his book. George, thanks for taking the time here today. What is the number one trick that people can start to implore right now in order to avoid some of the investing pitfalls or traps that are out there? Well, I always say, if you follow the trends, you'll fall for the traps. And unfortunately, a lot of young people out there, they're kind of spooked by the, the stock market and what their parents did. And so they're turning to things like NFT and crypto. And even worse, permanent life insurance has made a wild comeback. If you look on Instagram, you see the words tax-free wealth strategist. That's a sign you're about to get scammed. So if you can just instead be the crockpot in a world full of microwaves and have that long-term mindset and stop timing the market, don't jump in and jump out. Just enjoy the ride. And if you f see this show, you'll see a lot of green. You'll see a lot of red. It can stress you out. So you got to just be calm and look for the long term. Okay, so let, let's walk through some of them because sure, if I was interested in, you know, fuzzy penguins, then, you know, maybe I would have bought into a lot of a lot of NFTs or tokens out there, but at the same time I would have been needing to be ready to incur risk, more outsized risk than some other asset classes or uh, areas of the market. I, I bring up NFTs, of course, because it's tied into some of the riskier or trendy as you mentioned at the time parts of the financial and investment conversation. So of crypto, NFTs, permanent life insurance, wh which one is really taking the cake from your own purview? Well, the, the one that's sort of the sexiest right now, of course, is crypto. With Bitcoin shooting up in value, everyone's going, see, we were right, we should all be in crypto. And the problem is young people are avoiding tax advantage retirement accounts like IRAs and 401ks, and instead hedging all of their bets on crypto. And that worries me because we also get calls on The Ramsey Show where people go, I put all my money into this coin because my buddy told me it was going to be the next one to take off, and now I lost all my money. You have to remember, this is some virtual roulette you're playing. This is still gambling, and I'm not anti-crypto, but you got to be doing the right things first. You've got to get out of debt. You've got to have the emergency fund. You must be investing into those tried-and-true investment assets like your 401k, the IRAs, index funds, mutual funds. That's what's proven to be successful over time. George, it's interesting, and we showed your book earlier here. You talk about the three stooges of wealth building. How did you come up and come down to this, and what are they? Well, as I've taken calls on The Ramsey Show and talked to so many people, I found that it really boils down to three things. It's greed, fear, and pride. Those are the three stooges of wealth building. And greed is that intense, selfish desire to build wealth really quickly. That's the get-rich-quick that can throw people off because you don't make good decisions when greed is at the forefront. Next is the fear. A lot of people have FOMO. What if I miss out on this investment and the timing in the market and this crypto? And instead, you should have JOMO, the joy of missing out, knowing that you're doing the right things. You're building wealth with confidence and peace. 
And lastly, you've got pride. And this is the thing that says, I'm better, I'm smarter, I know exactly what stock to invest in, and that's when people lose their butts. So instead, you gotta have humility. And so if you can have that generosity thing to fight against that greed, you can have the JOMO to fight against that FOMO, and then you have the humility to fight against the pride. I found that is the most peaceful way to build wealth. You know, additionally here, George, a lot of people are looking to build wealth so that they can retire either early or retire on time with you know less considerations or less concern here. When you think about retirement accounts and, and how people can make sure that they are avoiding traps but setting themselves up adequately for retirement, I wonder you know where you immediately point to there and some of the investing recommendations or guiding tips or guiding North Stars, however you want to look at it, that you're putting out there. Absolutely. Well, Dave Ramsey and I are actually going to be breaking this down in a virtual event called Investing Essentials on May 21st and 22nd. So I encourage all of your viewers to join us for that, RamseySolutions.com slash Investing Essentials. But the real foundation here is you've got to get out of debt. Most people can't invest 10 or 15 percent because they have payments. And so once you become debt free, on average in, in two years, our followers for the baby steps get out of debt. Then you get the emergency fund in place because when you invest with no cushion for life, you're going to run into some problems when you have to put that next emergency on the credit card instead of investing in your future. And then finally, once you're out of debt with the emergency fund, invest 15% into those tax advantage retirement accounts first, like your, your 401k through an employer or your IRA outside of an employer. Roth is going to be awesome because you'll build that wealth tax-free with using after-tax money. So that's the simplest version, and mutual funds and index funds are great places to put that money, not in your single stocks or your crypto coins. And then just lastly, George, while we have you here, I, I mean, we've been looking at study upon study of what millionaires are, are doing successfully around this to plan for retirement, where it's perhaps a little bit easier, at least from, from their estimation and their own financial planning. But what are the millionaire type of tips, or at least the tendencies of millionaires, that the layperson like us can make sure that we're also tapping into to set ourselves up? Absolutely. This is something we covered in our national study of millionaires. We studied over 10,000. Turns out eight out of 10 said that that employer retirement plan was the key vehicle to becoming a net worth millionaire. And on top of that, millionaires, unlike what you imagine on TV, they drive used reasonable cars. They drive the Honda Civics, the Toyota Camry. It's four years old. They live on less than they make. They don't have bajillion dollar homes. They simply follow these tried and true steps and they don't fall for these trends. They're not trying to live a flashy lifestyle. And yet these are the millionaires that are pulling up to the next at, at the stoplight in the Toyota Camry, not in the Lamborghini. So we have to reset our expectation and see ourselves as future millionaires. And that's what it took for me to get there. All right, George Kamel, who is the host of the George Kamel YouTube channel and co-host of The Ramsey Show. George, thanks so much for taking the time here today to kick off the show. Thanks, Brad. Certainly. Well, for many Americans, home ownership is seeming more and more out of reach. According to new analysis from Zillow, home prices have jumped 42 percent since 2020, but the average person needs to earn 80 percent more than they did at that time in order to comfortably afford a home in today's market. So why are homes becoming less and less affordable? That's the big question. Here with the latest, we've got our very own Molly Moorhead. Molly, what, what's going on here and why is it so hard to be able to afford a home right now? Hey, Brad. Um, so in addition to that increase in home prices, which 42% is not nothing, um, inflation has been on the rise since the pandemic and interest rates have followed. And so that means the cost of financing a home is so much more than it was four years ago. If you look at the average rate on a 30-year loan in March of 2020, it was 3.5%. Today, it's around 6.8, 6.9. And so it's this double whammy of higher home prices and higher financing costs. So what advice do you have for prospective home buyers out there right now? Yeah, well, it's not easy. This is a tough market. But a couple of things you can do are, uh, number one, watch the Fed. A lot of economists, market watchers think that we still have three interest rate cuts potentially uh, coming this year from the Federal Reserve, and that will help uh, the, the rate you qualify for on if you apply for mortgage. And so if you're in a position where you can time your home purchase a little bit, you don't have to buy right now, then watch what happens uh, more broadly with interest rates because that can help you. 
Uh, second would be negotiate agent commissions. This was not really in play until very recently with this uh, settlement with the Realtors Association. There was long time been a kind of de facto 6% commission, but now uh, all of that is negotiable. So go into your home purchase, ready to negotiate what your, uh, com what your agent's gonna get paid. And then the third thing is uh, not a quick fix, but work to improve your credit score. Uh, make on-time bill payments, pay off debt as much as you can, and that will improve your credit score, which will in turn get you a better rate on a mortgage. Molly, thanks so much. Molly Moorhead, Yahoo Finance Zone. Coming up, everyone, how do we balance relationships and money? Well, we've tapped our friend and huge personal finance influencer, Haley Sachs, also known as Mrs. Dow Jones, to help us break down and navigate the gray areas of love and finances. Keep it locked here for that next. JLo once said, my love don't cost a thing. You thought I was gonna sing it for you. And while you can't buy love, money can interfere with the matters of the heart. Finance problems are still one of the leading causes of divorce. So how can you navigate money and love, hearts? Joining me now is Haley Sachs, AKA Mrs. Dow Jones, a zillennial finance expert and founder of Finance is Cool. Haley, great to have you here with us in studio. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So let, let's take a look at this in a deep dive. Looking at money and marriage, should people combine finances after they tie the knot? Wow. Whoa. Throw that to you. So basically, when it comes to combining finances after you've tied the knot, 
There are three main ways to do it, and you gotta choose which one works for you and your partner. So the first one is a percentage-based split. So you would take both of your incomes and look at how much you make and how much you're spending and do it with that. The second one is you can just go with the richer partner pays for everything, which I mean, for a lot of people sounds pretty good. Just let them take care of it or you take care of it, whatever works. Sure. And then the third is, I like to call the Dwayne Wade, Gabrielle Union split. What is this? That's the 50-50. Okay. Because they've got different net worths, different incomes, but it doesn't matter. No matter what, they're going down the middle. And when they admitted this, it was actually very controversial, but that's what works for them as a couple. Yeah, and you have to decide what does work for you. So how do you know as well if a prenup is right for you? I mean, personally, I think a prenup is right for everyone just because it makes you go through your finances and be super open with who you're marrying about what you're bringing into the marriage. Mm -hmm. Cause marriage is a contract. So, you know, the same way that people have health insurance or car insurance, a prenup is just marriage insurance. And seeing as 50% of marriages end in divorce, it sounds like something that we should all have. All right, if we haven't stepped on toes yet, we're about to step on toes with this next one. How do you navigate lending money to friends and or significant others as well? So, you know, if someone asks you for money, that can be a very stressful thing, especially if it's someone that you're close with. But I always say, take a second when they ask you, don't respond right away. Hmm. That's a great negotiating tactic Why is that? just in general. Because you don't want to say yes or no in the moment because you might agree to something that you're actually not that comfortable with. Hmm. You know, so if you say, okay, let me think about this, then you can come back and actually figure out, is this something that I can afford to do? Because whenever you lend someone money, you have to basically assume that you're not gonna get it back. You have to, it has to be money that you're okay with losing. Hmm. So don't be afraid, you don't ever loan money that you really need. Loan money that you're comfortable taking a risk with. Um, and then the other thing about lending money is that you really wanna make sure that you have a term of agreement. Right. You gotta have a contract with them because otherwise they just think, oh, they're giving me money, whatever, I can go and do whatever with this. But if you make it a bit more official, then it does make the whole partnership feel more official and they will then respond in that way and hopefully pay you back. You mentioned Dwayne Wade, Gabrielle, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering what is the most fascinating financial kind of couplehood or marriage or um, partnership that you've heard of that you've kind of come across and said, oh my gosh, that, that's really striking that that's how they decided to go about things. Well, I mean, every couple, of course, is different, and most of them are pretty close-lipped about it. But I do like that 50-50 split for Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union. Trying to think about another couple that did it really cool. And it's really interesting, too. I'll add this on top of it, because even in a lot of pro athletes' management of their finances as well, they say, okay, we're only going to live off of perhaps what my earnings mm -hmm. from playing the sport are. Mm -hmm. And then endorsements, that's what we're going to be able to kind of put away and make sure that we're saving correctly. I mean, that's been an interesting way that we've seen a lot of people who have high net worth, high income, mm -hmm. be able to really navigate a windfall of cash that they might be coming into, but wanting to be responsible on top of that too. Of course, and especially when you're in a high earning season mm -hmm. where you have a lot of money coming in, but it might not last forever. It's so important to just allocate a little bit of money for your living expenses, but then be putting the rest away for the future for those years that you're not a pro athlete. There aren't endorsements rolling in and things are a bit quieter, but then you still have that nest egg to rely on. Right, absolutely. All right, we're gonna continue to have more of these conversations. Thanks so much for joining Thanks me for on set. Thanks for having me. Kicking off this new week here with us, Mrs. Dow Jones. And coming up, Excited for retirement? Hey, hello. We can break down how you can set yourself up for a cushy retirement without depending on social security. That's coming up next.
It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination and here every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking and we've got you covered with our quarter by quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step by step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. It's April, so it must be National Social Security Month. You know, Social Security, the benefits and payments going to qualified retirees and other groups. Most people will get the benefits at some points of their life, but for those of us who don't plan on retiring within the next 10 years, we can still hope the fund might be insolvent by 2034, meaning they may not be able to pay 100% of scheduled benefits, according to the trustee's report. To break down how you can prepare for a future potentially without full Social Security benefits, we've got Rianne Horgan, who is the Silver founder and CEO. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me, Brad. Absolutely. Let's, let's dive in right there because we can potentially be getting an update on the solvency or insolvency of Social Security any minute now, any day now. And so how does that affect so many potential retirees out there, people who are planning to retire but might not be able to tap into the same benefits that past generations have been? Yeah, well, let's start with past generations. So Social Security was created in 1935. Wow. So just think about that for a second. Like, a lot has changed since 1935. I mean, in the midst of the Great Depression, yes, they were great still like, we need Social Security. Yeah, but back then, yeah. less than 50% of Americans were living until they were age 60. Wow. So today, 80% of us are living um, to 80 plus. And so we have this longevity, um, which is a great thing in many sides, but you know, Americans more and more are needing longevity insurance. Um, one of the things I think a lot about is that you know, the Americans that are retiring today are the first generation of Americans that are retiring en masse without a pension. Mm. Right? We talk a lot about 401ks. You guys were talking about IRAs and retirement savings earlier. A lot of the focus has been on how to save for retirement, but think about it now, the average 65-year-old is trying to figure out how to take money out of these accounts right. for the first time how to make it last a lifetime. Um, and that's where Social Security comes in because it is the one source of lifetime income for every single American. So what can Americans, what can people do today to set themselves up for a potential future without yeah. Social Security? So I think the reality is there will be Social Security, but um, things are gonna need to change. Like the math does not work. Um, you it's know, not math and as they it's would not, say. Yeah, so the, you know, the parties are at odds. Um, the Democrats are saying let's tax higher income earners. The Republicans are saying let's you know, change the actual payouts. I think the reality is that the first thing is that folks need to actually understand how it works. Like you need to be paying into the system to get benefits out. Um, you know, there are a lot of structural inefficiencies in Social Security. Folks that have lower income earnings, folks that take time out of the workforce to care for family members are all doubly penalized. Penalized because you're not earning you know, when you're taking time out of the workforce, sure. and then penalized again um, when you retire. So I think the first thing to think about is you know, making sure, whether it's full-time or part-time work, that you're actually getting enough Social Security credits. Mm -hmm. You need to work for 10 years um, to get so your full Social Security or to qualify for Social Security. Um, the threshold is actually not that high. It's just under $7,000 of income per year to actually pay in. And so when you think about the trend to part-time work, um, a lot of part-time work can actually contribute to a Social Security earnings history. What, and you mentioned logjam in D.C., you yeah. mentioned where the parties are aligned right now in terms of their own plans or agenda to try and make sure that Social Security is remaining afloat. But what other potential policies are being discussed that could potentially move forward to keep it uh, solvent? Yeah. So I think there's a couple things. The first is that, I mean, as, as a whole, it's how do you modernize Social Security? Sure. Um, so 1935 rules don't really work anymore. So you are seeing a lot of discussion around caregiving credits. So think about the growing population of Americans that are caring for either younger or older family members. And each time you take yourself out of the workforce, not only are you not earning income, but you're also not earning Social Security credits. So Social Security um, and policymakers are thinking about, OK, well, how do you actually give credits to caregivers? Um, the second is, well, what's the right um, method for actually doing an inflation adjustment? So one of the amazing um, 
benefits of Social Security is it has an annual cost of living adjustment. Mm -hmm. But today, the cost of living adjustment is actually um, based on a worker's cost of living rather than a retired individual's cost of living, which are actually quite different. Um, and so discussion in Washington around how could you change that. Um, and then the final thing is retirement age. And this is deeply unpopular you know, across the American public because no one wants to work longer. Right. But the reality is that um, you know, if we're living until our mid-80s and 90s, um, it is highly likely that the retirement age um, is going to change. And that is one of the ways that Washington is saying, well, look, if we delay retirement age, you can still take your benefits early. You just won't get the full benefit until you hit a later age. You know, where are we seeing companies, corporations, perhaps try to step into the game here and make sure that they're doing their part to help out their employees as well in their retirement ambitions? Yeah. So this is where I would say that companies are actually letting down employees. So the mm -hmm. huge focus on the savings generation, so how do you get the younger employees to save for retirement? But employee, employers are walking away when it comes to retirement. There's, you know, in the old days, you had a pension, you had employer health care, someone was taking care of you. Today, this American generation is paying for health care on their own. They're trying to figure out how they're going to finance long-term care. They're deeply afraid of aging into poverty. Uh, and so this is where I think financial institutions actually have an opportunity to step into the gap that employers have left. Employers have said, we don't want to be responsible for you know, our former employees' retirement. And so now financial institutions need to step in and say, okay, we're going to help you manage that IRA. We're going to help you think about how that um, direct deposit stream, um, that monthly payment that you're getting from Social Security, how that can last a lifetime and how it can cover your expenses. You know, it, and it's interesting, just lastly while we have you here, I, I got to wonder for a lot of the people that are trying to figure out what the real age is right now, what are, what are you hearing that median age of retirement to actually be? So um, I, in our data at Silver, we see a couple trends. Um, the first is that many folks are still retiring at 65 because it's the year you're also eligible sure. for Medicare. Yeah. And the reason that they're doing that is that health care pre-age 65, if you're paying for it yourself, really expensive. Mm. And the average ACA plan, if you don't have a subsidy, is $700 a month. Um, but increasingly, we are seeing people retiring pre-65, and what they're doing is they're transitioning to part-time work. So they're saying, look, I'm going to retire at 62. I'm going to transition to part-time work. I'm going to find that job that has good health care benefits to bridge me to Medicare and to get me that extra income before I fully retire. Rian, I think you just helped us come up with our first wealth-themed merch item, a T-shirt that just says 1935 rules don't work anymore. Thank you so much for joining us here. As long as Dude With Sign doesn't beat me to it. Rian Horgan, who is the Silver founder and CEO, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, Brad. Appreciate it. Well, the jobs report is out this Friday. You may know what it is, but why is it so important? We've got you covered. Ross Mack, breaking down how you should be looking at that report. All right, now, did you know the U.S. economy gets a monthly report card? Yep, and it's called the Jobs Report. And it's released on the first Friday of every month by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to paint a picture of just how good the overall economy is doing. Now look, the primary data points that investors focus on are how many jobs are created, the unemployment rate, and wage growth. Now let me break all that down for you. Now first things first, you get non-farm payrolls, and that's gonna monitor full and part-time job creation while excluding seasonal jobs, you know, like farmers. Now secondly, you got the unemployment rate. Now that's the total number of people in the world workforce that don't actually have jobs who are out actively looking for one. And lastly, you got the average hourly earnings or wage rate, and that's going to measure how much workers earn in each respective industry. Now you got to ask the question, why does this actually matter? Well, it directly impacts everything from policy decisions in Washington, D.C., to the interest rates on your loans and even the stock market performance. For instance, a surge in employment, that's going to suggest businesses are booming, possibly leading to higher incomes and overall consumer confidence. But now on the flip side, if unemployment actually ticks up, it might signal economic trouble as ahead. However, when job growth is a little too rapid, it can also signal inflation, possibly affecting everything from your mortgage rate to the cost of your groceries. Look guys, this report gives us valuable insight, and over the long term, as unemployment falls, the stock market, it tends to go higher. It's your boy Ross Mack, and this is Maconomics for Yahoo Finance. One in three Americans have more debt than savings. That's according to a bank rate survey. To paraphrase the notorious B.I.G., more credit cards, more problems. Nearly half of Americans have at least two credit cards. According to Experian, that data coming in now to break down how many credit cards make sense for you. We've got Yahoo Finance's very own Kendall Little. What's the real number here? 
So there's actually a couple reasons why you might want to only use one credit card. Okay. You know, if you're worried about those high interest rates when you have a credit card debt, then one card can really help you keep your expenses streamlined throughout the month. If you want to have one account, you can look to to see exactly what you're spending, know what your budget is all month long. Um, there are a couple other reasons though too. You know, we love credit card rewards. So one mm -hmm. card can help you use maybe a 1.5% or 2% cash back card to make sure you're maximizing every single expense without having to strategize too much where you're using which card. Um, and then also, if you open up a new card and you want to work toward a sign-up bonus, then using one card, that single card, throughout the intro period, so you can meet the spending threshold over the time that you have to score that big bonus. So when should people have more than one credit card? What is the determining decision-making factor that they should be thinking about there? I think the biggest reason to use multiple cards is really diversifying your rewards. So again, if rewards are really important to you, maybe you have a travel credit card you use to book your flights and book your hotel rooms when you travel, but that doesn't necessarily reward you at home. So maybe you have a cash back card that you can use on your groceries and your gas and dining out. Um, so kind of diversifying those rewards can really help you maximize throughout. But again, you have to make sure if you're using multiple accounts that you're tracking it throughout the month so that you're not taking on those high interest rates. Kendall Little, Yahoo Finance Zone. Thank you so much, Kendall, for mm -hmm. breaking this down. Thanks. Appreciate it. Coming up, everyone, we've got much more here on Wealth right after this short break.
retailer originally known for its yoga wear, Lululemon has evolved into a competitor of Nike, Adidas, and many more. But what led to Lululemon's success? Let's dive into the company's biggest moments with Beyond the Ticker. Lululemon was founded in 1998 by Chip Wilson. On July 27, 2007, Lululemon went public via an initial public offering, an IPO, on the NASDAQ at $18 per share. In March 2013, Lululemon recalled 17% of its black yoga pants for being too sheer, which cost it roughly $60 million in lost sales, according to the New York Times. That November, Wilson resigned as chairman following accusations of fat shaming brand strategies. Wilson previously told Bloomberg TV that issues with his company's leggings were because, quote, some women's bodies don't work for the pants. In June 2020, Lululemon took a chance at at-home online fitness with the acquisition of Mirror for $500 million and rebranded it as Lululemon Studio. In 2023, the company announced plans to ditch the Mirror Fitness hardware with plans to end its classes in 2024. To soften the blow for investors, it signed a five-year strategic global partnership with Peloton, which would stream its classes on the connected fitness platform and produce and sell Peloton-branded clothes. Lululemon shares soared over 57% in 2023, with the company hitting an all-time high stock price of $511.29 on December 29th. Lululemon continues to expand and compete with the giants of the athletic apparel industry just this year, announcing new footwear offerings, including its first-ever men's collection. According to a recent survey from Fidelity, 93% of women still feel stressed when it comes to managing their finances. But as women, they get more, but as women get more money, the stress starts to fade. We had Sally Krawcheck, Elves co-founder and CEO, on with us earlier this month. Here's what she had to say. As women have more money in their hands, they become more confident. Um, they use their money differently, they invest their money differently, they spend their money differently than men. Um, they give their money away to a greater rate uh, and tend to give it more to organizations that support women and girls. And let's bring in Gene Shotsky, who is the HerMoney.com CEO and host of the podcast Her Money with Gene Shotsky to discuss more. Gene, great to see you. First and foremost, as we think about what is going to be the great wealth transfer and the number of women that are going to be coming into even more equity positions, even more financial security perhaps even as well, where is that number one step that you're seeing or thought process you're seeing being initiated on how to really kind of de-risk and manage some of that financial stress and, and put that to the side even? You know, I don't know that de-risk is actually the word that I would use. I think that women um, need to take advantage of this opportunity as more wealth comes into their hands. Sally's absolutely right when it comes to the wealth transfer and make sure that we're investing enough. Um, historically, women have sat back a bit. We've kept more of our money in cash than men have, 70% compared to 60%. And we need to make sure that we're not only investing, but that we're investing enough and that we're investing early enough to put our money to work for us. And so with that, where have you seen areas where women are, are taking on more risk versus where men might be identifying risk? So when, when we look at how women look at money, um, women are more likely, according to a piece of research that we conducted at Her Money um, in conjunction with Principal Financial, women are more likely to say to them that financial wellness feels like financial peace. In other words, an absence of stress, which is kind of the antithesis of taking risk. It's what leads us to take a bit of a back seat and hold on before we put our money to work. And so the important move for women is to get into this game, to make sure that we are investing that we're maxing out the money that we are putting into our 401ks from as early an age as possible, that we're taking enough risk 
with the money that is in those 401ks or IRAs. In other words, investing enough of that money in stocks and that we get as get enough help with that strategy as we need. Um, you just flashed a, a statistic up about the percentage of women that are seeking financial help. If we're not sure that we're making the right moves, getting a financial professional on board or even picking up the phone and calling the administrator of your 401k plan where you can often get some free financial help and suggestions is a is a really good move. Yeah. At Her Money, we, we started an investing club online for women. It's called Investing Fix. We've got hundreds of women who are learning about investing with us every other Monday night on Zoom, and they're making positive changes in their lives. Where are there, I guess within those conversations and from your own findings, where are there industries that have tended to provide even more of a pathway uh, for success, for flexibility as well for women? You know, when we're talking about flexibility, you're talking about uh, choices in jobs and choices in careers. And we're, we're seeing that in general across the board these days. There's more of an opportunity to work from home. There's more of an opportunity to work remotely. There's more of an opportunity to schedule your own hours than there used to be. But we have to make sure that we're not making compromises in our ability to earn a decent living on the way to that flexibility. You know, the the wealth gap and the gender wage gap are still not just present, but incredibly sticky. And one reason for the gender wage gap is that we see women still being the ones who take breaks from work to care for kids and care for aging parents. When we do go back into the workforce, um, we often find that we have to do it at lower salaries than before and and lower rates of, of being able to climb the ladder than before. That, that holds us back. And so it's important for women to continue to ask important questions about about things like when compromising for flexibility is actually worth it versus paying for services that will allow us to stay on that trajectory if taking a step back at work is not something that we want to do, but something that we feel we have to do. Jean, just lastly, while we have you, for all the fellas out there watching, what, what can we do to help close the gender wealth gap as well? I think it's really important that um, you're not just hiring women if you're in a position to hire, um, that you're hiring women of color for whom the gender wage gap is, is even larger, but that you're promoting women and you're giving them an opportunity, giving us an opportunity to scale the uh, the corporate ladder, so to speak. And for women who are partnered, it's really important that you aren't ceding the management of the investments to um, to your partner, male or female. This needs to be something that both people are doing throughout their lives so that both people are able to do it if one or the other needs to take a step back for a while. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if it was ceded to me, I, I mean, we would have been investing in a lot of Beanie Babies and that was the wrong decision for sure here. Jean Shotsky, who is the HerMoney.com CEO and host of the podcast Her Money with Jean Shotsky. Jean, great to see you. Thanks so much for taking the time. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Coming up, the tax deadline is right around the corner. We'll tell you everything that you need to know about the child tax credit. Much more on wealth after the break. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome to Wealth, everyone. I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. From our hand-picked community of experts, take a listen to what they had to say as we got the show off the ground. I think financial literacy has a stigma. Now you're talking, how do we implement it early on so that it becomes a part of our lives every day? A lot of life, a little bit of money. How do I extend this? Over half of Americans cite inflation as the greatest obstacle to financial security. Pay your bills on time. Late payments really ding your credit score. You've got to reduce your debt. Anything that is going to make you a target of the high interest rate environment, you need to take a second look. Listen, I think it's so important to make sure that your house is ready for sale. The key thing to remember here though, Brad, is not to go in debt in order to do so. Try to do these upgrades at the speed of cash. All things with the keys of the crib there. Appreciate it, Jay. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. I don't feel richer after this segment, Andy. I tell you what, I'm getting up, I'm walking off set. You're going back to those numbers, and if you're not there, you gotta figure out what that number is that you need to hit. Forget everything you've been told about estate planning. It's not just for the wealthy. The estate is for those in Beverly Hills. No, you have life insurance, you created an estate. Planning that early retirement you always dreamed of? Hey, maybe. If you're one of those people that has not started yet, get started. If you start early enough, invest wisely, and make right and smart financial moves, you can retire much earlier than those preconceived retirement ages that we, we all think about. It's really the people in the middle who have to struggle for saving for college and saving for retirement at the same time. Because the last thing you want to do is retire and then think, oh, I've made a mistake. There is a responsible way to manage coming into a large amount of money. Longer term, you're thinking about things like gifting, estate tax, asset protection, not just the dollars and cents at this point, but what are your goals and values? I already know what I'm doing. Uh, first and foremost, I'm gonna legally change my government name to first name Bless, last name highly favored. An introduction to Maconomics with one of our favorite influencers, Ross Mack. When it's all said and done, you just gotta ask yourself, where's the smart money? The reality is you're looking five, 10 years down the line. You gotta continue to take care of your biggest asset as if you're going to play again on Sunday um, because it's gonna pay off for you in, in the long run. TikTok on the clock, Kesha once said. We're counting down to tax deadline day. That's right, everyone, April 15th, right around the corner. And one debate has been front and center, the child tax credit. Yahoo Finance's Rochelle Akufo joins us now with the breakdown. Rochelle, what do we know here? What is the child tax credit and how can people take advantage of this? Well, just in time for Financial Literacy Month, Brad, of course, kids coming back from spring break. So here's what you need to know about the child tax credit. Now, this is actually a federal program that's supporting Americans raising children. So a couple of numbers to keep in mind. You can lower your tax bill per $2,000 per qualifying child. Now, obviously, last year, a lot of people saw perhaps a bigger amount that they were able to claim, but that's because we were in the middle of the pandemic. People were still getting some extenuating cir um, circumstance payments. They gave it a little extra bump that tax year. So you're gonna see it a little bit lower this year, but good to keep in mind that there are some ifs you need to keep in mind. That's income, filing, and of course, the status of the child or the dependent that you're trying to claim, Brad. Okay, so Rochelle, how do you know which dependents qualify? I mean, we have a cat named Monkey at home. I'm pretty sure he doesn't fall within this child tax credit. So how do I know about, how do I go about knowing this for sure? Well, unfortunately, unless your cat named Monkey has a social security number that will automatically disqualify them. They do have to be a human being. Um, they have to have a valid social security number. They have to be under the age of 17 over the past year, at the end of last year. Now, a child or dependent for the purpose of the child tax credit, that doesn't just include your, your traditional biological children. You have stepchildren, eligible foster children, stepbrothers and sisters, half-brothers and sisters, as well as dependents of any of these. So think grandchildren, nieces and nephews as well. Another circumstance here, the child can't have provided more than half of their own financial support the past year. We know some teens are working, so keep that in mind when you're making those calculations. They also have to have lived with you for more than a year, be claimed properly as a dependent on your taxes, and the child has been over the past year a U.S. citizen, national, or a resident alien as well, Brad. And Rochelle, not everyone who files for the, tax, uh, the child tax credit gets the full amount here, we should note. Um, so all of this considered, how much should people be expecting? 
So two numbers that you should keep in mind, because as we mentioned, the ifs there, so income, filing status, and status of the child. So we covered the children here. When it comes to income, if you make $200,000 or less, you could qualify for the full amount here of at least $2,000 plus per qualifying child. If you're filing jointly, that threshold is then $400,000. Now, that also includes if you're a single parent, which classifies as a head of household filer, so keep that in mind. And everyone else with an income under $200,000, that also means that you will qualify for at least that $2,000 tax credit. Now, the interesting thing is once you're above that threshold, that's when the math gets a little bit trickier there. It gets reduced $50 for each $1,000 that your income exceeds that threshold. And of course, the best way to always make sure you're staying on the right side of everything is to go to the IRS website. And you're going to want to have your 1040 handy and look for a schedule 8812 form. So this is going to help you plug in all your numbers from your 1040. You know exactly how much you're going to qualify for for the child tax credit and you file them together. So make sure you include that schedule 8812 with your 1040, make it as accurate as possible and get all the child tax credit that's due to you, Brad. All right. Yahoo Finance is own and steady rep in Howard University, Rochelle Akufo. Thanks so much, Rochelle. Appreciate it. That's right. <laughs> Let's do a final check of the markets here, everyone, as we're taking a look at the major averages. We've had them in the corner of your screen here for you folks, just so you can keep tabs. The Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ all in negative territory as of right now. We, of course, are beginning the second quarter of 2024 here. And after some record highs that we saw in Q1, larger question of what those catalysts will be, how that will translate through to your wealth, your investments, and how you manage and grow your money as well here. There we're taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. That does it for us, though, right now. I'm Brad Smith. Thanks for watching.